Okay, good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. All right. Well, then, um, welcome, everyone. This is a special planning committee and official plan review working uh, committee meeting, continuation from our ones before. Uh, everyone, welcome. And um, the meeting is starting at 9.02 a.m. on Thursday, August 6th. Uh, this is an electronic meeting being held in accordance with Section 238 of the Municipal Act 2001 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And at this point, I'm just going to confirm that everyone is here. Um, I, can, I can see all council members and all committee members. Madam Clerk, we're good. Okay, great. And I will also confirm that our CAO, our clerk, our Director of Development Services and Environmental Sustainability and other members of our management team are present. And my last sort of duty here in running this through was that public input has been available uh, via planning at muskokalakes.ca. And the last part is in terms of motions, the motions have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite this meeting. And secondly, voting members shall physically raise their hand until the chair has confirmed the vote. If the vote is unclear, a ver verbal vote shall be recorded by the clerk and this is not considered to be a recorded vote. So, great. Okay, so um, on we go. Um, there is no supplementary agenda uh, today. And is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest by anybody? Just raise your hand if there is. Okay, that's terrific. Then I, I would just like to uh, read this motion that moves us um, out of our, our uh, current structure. Moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Jagowitz, be it resolved that pursuant to section 2.3.2 of the Township's procedure, Procedural Bylaw 2019-079, the rules of procedure are hereby suspended for the duration of the official plan review policies direction workshop, and that they will be reinstated at the conclusion of the workshop. Um, any comments? Okay, can I put the motion to a vote? Those in favor? Um, this, in, this includes the, yeah, the committee members. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Madam Clerk. Okay, great. All right, that's Carrie. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, uh, we have Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond uh, back to, to lead, lead us through uh, today. This is a review of what we've talked about over the last meetings uh, before we, this heads out to the public. And I believe that we are also going to discuss how we get out to the public with this at the end of this. So I, I think without further ado then, I will turn it over to either um, Mr. McDonald or Mr. Diamond. Mr. McDonald, welcome. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Good morning to all of you, thanks for that. Um, glad to be back and uh, to uh, continue talking about the official plan and uh, moving forward. In terms of how uh, this session is going to go, I'm just going to briefly run through it and then take any questions of uh, clarification. But our first uh, order of business is to present uh, the policy directions that we have updated uh, based on the comments received uh, in previous meetings. Uh, we've spent considerable time on it. And you'll see that uh, we've provided uh, much more detail in terms of what the policy directions are all about. And I look forward to talking to the group about that. Uh, the policy directions in particular that we're going to re-review, uh, number one, lake system health, number two, uh, recreational carrying capacity, number three, flooding, number four, natural heritage, six, watershed planning, uh, 14, permitted uses in rural areas, 17, site alteration in the waterfront, 18, water access, 19, grandfathering, um, and 20, expansion of existing uh, marinas. So that's the first order of business. Uh, we did add uh, a new policy direction at the end of the document dealing with waterfront character areas. So we wanna run that by the group as well uh, and get feedback. Uh, there was one policy direction uh, that we didn't get clear direction on in the last uh, series of sessions, and that's number, number 10, dealing with rural lot creation. There was a good discussion on it, 
but uh, after all was said and done, uh, there wasn't clarity on what the policy direction should actually be saying or what direction we should be going in, at least for getting public input. We don't have any plans to discuss the policy directions uh, that are not uh, have not been changed based on the conversation. I'm in your hands, Councillor Bridgman, in terms of dealing with that, but we don't really want to revisit the ones that we haven't changed. Um, and uh, those are in the majority, and I'm hoping uh, that is the case. Uh, the next thing we want to discuss is, is the form of the document itself that goes out to the public. Uh, we've all been working with this working document, but we have some ideas on how we can structure this uh, for a broader public circulation. And as you mentioned, Councillor, uh, the last thing we want to talk about is the form of consultation uh, following this meeting. Uh, we have uh, some ideas and I think we have an approach and we want to run it by the group uh, and get uh, the group's uh, thoughts uh, before we, we obviously start that uh, consultation program. So that's our agenda, Councillor Bridgman. I'm assuming that there are folks who may want to add things to the agenda and perhaps now is the time to see if, uh, if there's that interest. Okay, thank you. And in terms of adding to the agenda, do you mean uh, items that may not have come up before? Uh, that's correct. I, I, I do note that there were a few emails uh, sent uh, prior to today's meeting um, on uh, cultural heritage was one item. Um, and uh, there was one other item, I believe, as well. And, and certainly uh, our approach to these meetings is, is if there's anything you guys want to talk about, we're here um, to talk about it. And this is the opportunity to do that before we go to the public. I'm certainly hoping this is the last of, of, of the meetings we're holding on the policy directions because we really do want to uh, move forward. The one thing I, I do want to add uh, before I, I turn it back to you, Councillor Bridgman, for a moment is that the policy directions themselves we can spend a lot of time wordsmithing. Um, I'm not as concerned about wordsmithing, perhaps as, as some may be. Uh, really, these are intended to go out and get uh, input on and, and obtain public input on. The wordsmithing will happen later when we actually write policy uh, and spend a lot of time with uh, this group um, on that. Um, so I'm less uh, concerned or inclined to talk about wordsmithing, I'm more interested in the idea behind the policy direction. I just wanted to put that out there again. Okay, thank you. And I understand you. I did think the format of how this goes out to the public so it's clear to them is, is going to be really essential for, for this. Um, so I do have one comment because I've had feedback since our last meeting, and it would appear that there, there are certainly members of the public who would like to have discussed or at least gone out to the public for discussion that we increase the lot size um, in, in new lots and add 150 feet to them to reduce density. So um, I wonder if we can put that in for public input because I, I would also be very interested to see what the public input on that would be. So that's just my comment. Um, anyone else have anything that they would like to, uh, Councillor Roberts? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to have um, discussion on um, number 22 um, um, on the uh, minerals. Um, so would you please add that to, to the, the list of discussion for today? So could I ask you, Councillor Roberts, is this something new or are you concerned with the wording? Or are you putting in new thoughts? Um, I'm very concerned. I don't even think I was at the same meeting where we talked aggregates. It complete, completely missed the huge expression of concern from the residents. And uh, I think we need to talk about it because <laughs> what I read there and said no change I have grave concerns, so I would like it added back in. Fair enough. That's what we're talking about right here. Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Councillor Roberts. It, it, we should be uh, discussing that, and that can't be just left the way it is. Thank you. Well, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, some of us are putting up our blue hands. You don't appear to be seeing them, but uh, maybe we, would you prefer our real hands or the blue hand? 
Uh, no, the blue hand's fine. <clears throat> okay. uh, honestly, I just hadn't gotten there yet. So thanks for the, oh. <laughs> thanks for the okay. reminder. <laughs> um, I'd just like to have a, a put a number nine uh, uh, to have a brief discussion on it. I'm not particularly happy with the comment that was, that was made there. So if we could just have a brief discussion on that. Okay, I see Mr. McNaughton writing all of this down. Uh, Mayor Harding. Thank you. Um, didn't get to uh, my comments last time or some new ideas that I'd like to kind of get some input on. Um, so one of them we talk about to uh, help development. You know, our official plan contemplates one cottage, one bunkie. But oftentimes when we end up clearing trees because everyone wants an 8,000 square foot cottage or 7,500 square foot cottage, what if we actually said you want two cottages, it's now 6,000 square feet divided by two cottages? We'd probably take down significantly less trees. The built form would probably be less on the property because you've got to fit them into your certain property, but depending on the property size. Um, so it might be interesting. I, I do know Gravenhurst official plan, I think, or in their zoning bylaw, allow two bunkies on the property if they have larger size lots. Um, and, and I put into that sort of overall discussion, talk about a 650 bunkie on as a second story boathouse, but what if I want to put it back 100 feet? Does it still have to be 650? Could it be a little bit larger and that we basically encourage development off the water through this official plan by giving people something a little bit more? Might be a concept just to discuss, so I put that out there. Um, I, I mentioned this last time and maybe it was confused. I don't want us to down zone properties, but I question whether or not, because right now it is not, we do not allow down zoning of properties. Resort commercial continues to be a massive issue and overdevelopment. And if we allowed certain properties to be able to be down zoned or considered down zoning, if that's what they wanted to do, might get us to more of a, a cottage flare with significantly lower densities to help us going forward. So I'll take a Sherwood Inn or let's take a uh, legacy cottages. That would be one and a half cottages, which is what would have been built there and certainly would have solved a lot of problems for many people around this table. So I'd like to have the consideration potentially of allowing down zoning. Looking forward just to have that discussion. And then the only final thing that I'm not sure we want to do this in the official plan or not, but we regulate interior use and we say you can only have this bedroom, you can't have that, and it creates bylaw enforcement regularly. So it probably again in the zoning bylaw, but do we really want to concern ourselves with the guy's back shed because he decides to throw a bed in it because we only allow one cottage and they want to have somebody else there? We create problems oftentimes. I, I'd rather be more concerned about lot coverage. Um, so I just, I wonder how we want to regulate and if we do really want to regulate interior reuse. I just flag that up there for some future discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Arnie? Thank you, Chair Bridgman. I'm uh, going to limit my comments. I shared with committee and several councillors who've reached out to me uh, some comments on the work plan and I'll just leave it. I've also shared it with the consultants. So I hope they've received that and uh, can deal with it as input as opposed to new discussion for today. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you. And through you, uh, I believe the conversation around cultural planning uh, that was referenced was from an email that I might have sent in just because I believe some of that discussion or some of that feedback has been provided and I wanted to ensure that there was going to be some kind of discussion and or policy direction that would explore how the township and I'm going to quote, will leverage natural, cultural, and historical assets to achieve a healthy, integrated, and viable municipality. So uh, I just wanted to be sure that those thoughts were going to be reflected, even if it wasn't in today's discussion, that it is something that is going to be contemplated. And I'm not sure if that is something that needs to go to the public. I, I, I know that there's many policies that are not included in today's discussion that might not need discussion. 
uh, but I certainly didn't want to have that lost. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, be I believe that's it for the added comments, Mr. McDonald. So I will turn it back to you at this point. Okay, so uh, thanks for that. Um, so I've uh, written all of those down. So we'll certainly come back uh, to those. Uh, my plan uh, still is to go through the ones that we have made changes uh, to to get uh, feedback on. And uh, with that in mind, I'm going to start with uh, number one, which is uh, lake system health. Uh, we had a very good discussion uh, about lake system health. Obviously, it's top of mind for many people uh, in the township and the broader area. And essentially what we've done uh, in the revised policy direction, which is in the second to last column uh, on, from the right, is to, be, is to provide more detail and a, and a greater focus on exactly uh, what uh, uh, enhancing, the policy, enhancing the policy framework actually means. Um, so um, what I'm going to focus on in this discussion and in the others is on what we've added to the policy direction. And in some cases we might have taken something out, but mostly it's uh, through additions. So, uh, so the policy direction is being reworded to be very clear uh, that we are going to be applying the enhanced protection policies that are set out uh, in principle in the district's official plan to development on vacant lots, redevelopment on vacant lots, and on new lots uh, created uh, within the township with these new policies uh, setting the stage for requiring greater setbacks uh, for buildings and leaching beds from the high water mark. Um, and this means, and you'll see this later on, that uh, one, of the, one of the policy directions and approaches we will be considering is increasing the minimum setback uh, from the uh, high water mark from 20 meters to 30 meters. It also means uh, potentially increasing the setback for leaching beds, which currently sits at 30 meters uh, to a greater number, which we have not uh, determined uh, at this point. It also means uh, no longer permitting the expansion of existing structures within whatever setback area we identify. And I'll come back to that in policy direction uh, number 19. And it also means that would, we would be establishing site alteration targets uh, that would be applied on a case by case basis to minimize site alteration as well. So once we go down the road of creating enhanced policies, there are some significant implications uh, uh, that, that arise as a consequence. And, and these um, are some of them. Um, in addition, the policy direction uh, uh, indicates that there would be uh, updated site alteration policies within the official plan uh, that would establish targets uh, with these targets dealing with a whole host of issues that we talked about last time, driveways, pathways, uh, stair accesses to the shoreline, uh, sun decks, party decks, outside fireplaces. And we certainly recognize that on the basis of an updated policy framework, it may mean that the township site alteration bylaw also has to be uh, updated as well at some point. Um, item C in the policy direction um, is the same as it was before, um, although we've added the specific lakes uh, that were identified um, as requiring causation studies by the district's plan. And that's Ada Lake, Brandy Lake, Bruce Lake, Stewart Lake, and Three Mile Lake. And we've added Leonard Lake as well. Um, and then last, uh, we included policies or we included a, a component of the policy direction that basically says uh, that causation studies could also be completed for other lakes other than those identified by the district and Leonard Lake based on specific triggers in addition to uh, phosphorus concentration. Um, we've added that last one in. Um, but you'll note uh, in our comments that it is up to the district to prepare causation studies and there are a few lakes that they have to look at. So we'd have to figure out how that would actually work uh, if other lakes were being considered in the future. I'm not saying it can't be done, just saying it's something to consider uh, moving forward. So essentially this policy direction is much more detailed, um, but it, it, it does serve as a launching point for a number of other changes we made uh, throughout the document. 
uh, dealing with lakefront development. Um, and it all stems from uh, incorporating enhanced policies within the, within the township's plan that, that essentially go beyond uh, what the district's plan uh, provides for uh, in, in the overall district. So any discussion or comments on the changes that, that, uh, that we've made in response to the comments received? Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Clark? Yeah, I'm actually trying to figure out how we got there. Um, all the discussion that I thought we had around this was not moving things back 100 feet, but actually incorporating um, studies, et cetera, prior to developing a lot uh, to create, uh, or at least to get recommendations uh, based on, on those studies as to what to do with a specific lot. Um, what you're doing, what this will do, and I'm, I, I understand it's just going to go out to the public and then we're going to get feedback. But um, uh, at, at this point, what we're actually doing is putting a restriction on a restriction. We're saying we're going to do all of these studies, but even before we get the studies, we're going to tell people they have to go 100 feet back or, or 30 meters back, and we have to do all kinds of things. So that may in fact and in fact i just looked at two lots where if you tell me i've got to go 30 meters back i'm going to be blasting into a rock face where if i'm if i'm 20 meters back i'm not so uh i think all you're doing is going to be creating a whole pile of minor variants and zoning bylaw uh requests again and uh putting a lot more stress on uh, on a system that's currently overwhelmed that's all i have Thank you. Uh, Member Arney? Thank you. I'll ditto that. I, I would like to see it um, included as a recommendation. We're already requiring site plan for waterfront development. Um, I, I think that if our site plan bylaw is uh, fixed, and I understand David can correct me that it's in the process of being reviewed, I think that can be dealt with. And then as Bob says, you can suit the development to the piece of property as opposed to a hard line. As soon as we put in hard lines, we end up in LPAT or variances, whatever. So I, uh, I, I, I agree there, there is um, an interest in encouraging development away from the waterfront, but I don't think it should be a requirement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Thompson? Uh, Laura, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, I believe that if you don't have requirements and you just encourage then people will um, do what they want and if they're not required to uh, if, if you have a requirement then people will say okay that's a requirement and if I need to do anything differently then I will get apply for an amendment and if our requirement is still 20 meters then people will build at 20 meters and they won't even think about with building at 30 meters and if you suggest that they do that they'll say well I don't have to so I'm not going to so I think that rather than hope that people will do the right thing and move further back off the waterfront we should require that they move further back off the waterfront and then provide exceptions in those areas that would require too much blasting or too much tree removal or whatever um, we can leave that up some discretion to staff to be able to um, put those uh, um, exceptions in place. And um, I also wanted to comment on uh, item B with respect to the targets. Um, I think this is a great idea, uh, but I want to uh, encourage that that would apply to all areas that touch the waterfront. So residential, commercial, and institutional waterfront zones, community and urban zones. You know, we, um, you know there's, there's uh, there's some waterfront property owners, both residential and commercial, that take pains to keep as many trees and as much vegetation in its original natural, natural state as possible. And others who take out huge swaths of trees and, um, and, uh, and clear cut their properties with the promise of planting back. Um, but we 
you know, we now know enough about watersheds and how they work to understand that retaining existing vegetation is far superior to planting back sticks of trees uh, that take decades to mature. Um, so I, I think there's no reason that we uh, shouldn't require all waterfront areas to maintain you know, substantial um, mature tree buffers and other vegetation buffers. So um, I, well, I would encourage these targets to be for all waterfront properties. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, it, it occurs to me that this discussion about um, being 20 meters or 30 meters back, we had quite extensively when we did 1414 and, um, and we had a lot of public consultation uh, and even from our, our uh, Sandy boss from the building department. I'm, I'm really concerned that we're focusing on this again because in fact, I'll just say in the old Muskoka where lots were, are considerably smaller, perhaps um, closer to Gravenhurst or, or the development of Lake Muskoka is a perfect example where we have very small lots on Walker's Point. And I think we're just putting a lot of obstacles that we're gonna have to manage later on and, and with everything becoming a variance, which is really a concern for me. I thought this discussion was pretty much put to bed. I didn't know that we were trying to, um, I, again, put, put more obstacles in place for, for others that are trying to redevelop their properties. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you. I agree with uh, Councillor Nishikawa, and I think uh, uh, Bob Clark made the same comment. You know, it's one thing to contemplate maybe pushing some cottages back and some new development, but theoretically, the other <clears throat> comment here is that no longer permitting expansion or, of existing structures within that setback area, every single property in Muskoka is probably built at 66 feet or closer. Forget about the, the 30 meters, meaning every single property will be legal non-conforming. You can't expand, you can't change. I've got a small 1,000 square foot cottage built at 50 feet. So now I have to, I can't expand it. I've got to tear it down and move it back to 100 feet because I want to add a 200 foot bedroom to the side of it. Um, we are creating massive, massive issues, not only time, energy, money, planning problems. Um, I, I, and again, if I've got a small cottage at 50 feet and I want to add something to it that I'm not allowed to, I'm now going to take down a bunch more trees, probably old mature trees at 100 feet back, and then they're going to clear cut the front. So I agree with Councillor Nishikawa. I, I'm pretty sure we'd have put this discussion to bed. Um, so I, I'm not in favor of this going forward, even to the public. If I could provide a comment at this point, uh, it might it might assist with the discussion. So when we uh, started off, uh, we had suggested that we simply mirror uh, the policy framework and the district's plan going forward. And we uh, got a very strong uh, flavor from the last discussion that we wanted to go, or the township wanted to go further than the district and be more restrictive than the district in terms of how it dealt with development along the waterfront. And when we start talking about enhanced uh, lake system health policy framework, uh, this is what it exactly means. So that's why we took the time to actually unpack what enhanced means, because we can't just say we want enhanced policies, but then not have enhanced policies. So if there is a desire to be more restrictive and have enhanced policies to deal with lakefront development, that's what these policies would lead to greater setbacks, less permissions on the waterfront, and yes, way more minor variances. And you'll see later in the policy direction that, that if we go forward with these and they actually end up being policy, there would also be a need for very uh, well-written policies that govern how minor variances would be dealt with because we do anticipate if, if all of these uh, come into fruition, that the workload in the planning department would increase significantly. 
um, and there would be many, many more minor variances. But what we're talking about here is about the first principle. Do we want waterfront development to be further back? Yes, no. And this is how you get there. Um, and yes, there will be exceptions, but this is where you start. Uh, right now it's 20, uh, we're suggesting 30. Again, keeping in mind, uh, and we we're aware of this too, this was a discussion item. Uh, some of these items were discussion items during the last zoning bylaw review. Um, the idea here is to get it back out there for comment. We're not deciding on whether it's a good idea or not as part of this discussion. We're only deciding whether it makes sense to go out and get feedback on it before we take that next step to figure out whether it's a good idea. Thank you for that. Uh, Member Scalati. I just had a couple of comments, uh, particularly in section B in the middle column there. We talk about the area of driveways, for instance, and maybe this is a spot where we should also include the word permeability. I know you don't want to wordsmith, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of driveways uh, suddenly seem to be paved. And uh, also you could apply it to the decks and some of, some of the other built form. Um, the other one I wanted to just specifically mention is perhaps uh, something to specifically protect the shoreline because it's not just the trees in the back that counts. Uh, people also seem to have to cut down all of the shrubs and grasses that naturally grow along the shoreline. And of course, we know that those are very important to, uh, to the health of the system. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Member Lindell. Thank you, Councillor Bridgman. Um, I just want to thank uh, our consultant, Mr. McDonald, for reminding us what stage we're at with this now. And like uh, Councillor Nishikawa, I sat in on a lot of those zoning bylaw discussions in the past and official plan reviews. And I did hear public support uh, from many quarters for increasing or trying to provide other mechanisms to control development right in the Lakeshore area. So I don't think there's any harm in going out to the public for more feedback on this now. This is not the final word. Um, we had a lot of input and I think it's responsible to obtain more public input on this issue at this time. Well, Councilor, thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Um, I want to comment on um, point C, where it ta talks about causation studies. And specifically, to begin with, um, the, the last sentence there, the hold may be lifted following the completion of a causation study, which identify the appropriate measures required to prevent further deterioration. Um, uh, that just gives a, 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 you know, a star to whoever did the causation study. But in the meantime, you have identified it, the lakes keeps failing. So I would like that word cha cha that word identified taken out and replace implement. Um, implement um, uh, steps or, or mitigating steps before the, the holding zone is raised. The other point I have on that is causation study was the one that was selected as by the by the by the um, the district as the to hang their hat on the only on pH. And science is showing that there's more threatening our lakes than just pH, uh, scientific problems. So um, I don't want to be restricted that the hold zone would only occur if, we, if, it, if the pH um, uh, was mitigated. There's other issues. So with the way it's written, it's only causation studies. Um, I guess, and that brings me to my last point, is that, um, again, we're just, the causation studies, we're just looking at pH, our phosphorus, there are others. So we got to have the ability, the township to go farther than the district and identify other threats to our lake health that we can action. I guess the point is we can action without doing an OP update. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Clark? Just a last comment, and let's pretend I didn't take my Tourette's medication this morning. Um, in any event, uh, you know, I'm listening to all this, and 
what's been summarized by Mr. McDonald, I believe, is in our entire discussion on this topic and what will probably turn into the lakefront development side of it, is to go to the public with the most restrictive side of everything that we've talked about in our discussions. Um, you know, push all the setbacks back, talk about permeability, talk about hard surfaces, uh, push all development back, um, uh, get everything off the lake. And to be honest with you, I don't think that's a good summary of our discussion. That's a good summary of a portion of this panel. Um, uh, the next thing is, I also feel, I don't know if there's meetings I didn't make or something, but we appear to be going, or the, these councils appear to be going over the same things over and over again. 2014, um, this 30 meter setback went out to the public, had public input. Uh, I agree with uh, Phil and Ruth that um, there are so many lots that when you push, <laughs> when you say your development's gonna be 100 feet back from the water, uh, you've just created uh, hundreds of undevelopable lots or hundreds of applications for variances. Um, as I can tell you as a developer and as a realtor, we can't get answers and get things through now. Our next committee meeting to get something through right now is December and I understand we're in unique times, but at a maximum of 10 uh, possible uh, variances or zoning amendments a month, uh, we're going to be looking at development timeframes like Toronto. Um, you know, I'm also mindful of, um, you know, our last meeting where apparently you all voted on something in March and are trying to reopen it for another whole discussion. Like how much, how much time do you have? <laughs> I have to ask, like how many times can you keep going over and over things just because you didn't get the answer you wanted? Um, we have a real resource problem and just remember what Mr. McDonald said, hey, we're gonna go out here with this and that's great. Let's say the public comes back and says, we want to go ahead with everything we just talked about and all of these way more restrictive ideas than what the district has. You're gonna end up at LPAT, you're gonna end up in all kinds of legals and you're gonna need a pile of people and we can't afford any more people right now. So that'll be tax increases. So let's make sure we talk to them about that. And I really beg the people that are pushing for this get off the lake business, go and sit with planning and go through a zoning, a, a, a site plan approval. This is not easy. We don't run around, if you're doing this right, and that again is probably the issue we're talking about, we don't run around hacking all the trees off of the water and cutting down shrubs and cutting everything down. Um, they don't let us do it. They come back and they look at, their, they're holding bonds on us now, they're doing all kinds of things to make us go back and do it. Your challenge is enforcement. It is not what the bylaws are. So, you know, whether it's permeability, David, I can tell you, they, you know, I've got three sites right now. The site plan says we are not allowed to pave um, and the clients want to, um, but they're not allowed to or they're going to get fined. So uh, I'm just trying to bring some reality to this. And I think the very last thing I'm going to say is when, when you want to put policies like this in place, just remember a lot of the people that are funding a lot of these different initiatives and things that we have, all have cottages sitting 35 feet off the water, all have two story boat houses, all have lower level lounges, they have their fire pit, they have their, their 12 port boat ports. Um, you know, I hope they don't burn down. I hope they don't have any kind of, uh, you know, insurance related issues or need to be rebuilt, et cetera, because all that property that's been developed in the front of the shoreline has the trees removed. They all have everything that they want. And now they're going to go 100 feet back if I understand what we're going to talk about. And we're going to tear a whole bunch more trees and things down. Anyway, that's my summary. Thank you. Um, Mayor Harding. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Just to provide a quick comment, and I appreciate the fact that the public want and this committee wants um, increased uh, environmental policies, but setbacks are not the only way. 
you know, I, we could go from a 10% lock coverage or we, we allow 11 in the OP. Why don't we just put a hard cap at that at 10? That's another way to increase our environmental policies versus just setbacks. And, and again, my issue with setbacks is that every single property we have will be legal non-conforming if we push to 100 feet. If I go to 9% lock coverage, I'm going to say only 20% of the properties or 10% would be legal non-conforming because so many are undeveloped and have lot development coverages. So I think there's another way to get to where we want to go versus just increase setbacks. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. McDonald, um, do you have what you need from this discussion? You need to unmute yourself. So the whole purpose of this was to actually show what enhanced law, enhanced policies look like. And, 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 and if this is what uh, is desired, this is what it means. And if that's the direction that we're receiving, uh, we've come up with some ideas on how that would actually work. I like uh, the mayor's idea about adding something else in here about looking at other development standards uh, on properties as well. I think that's a very good uh, addition uh, that could be made here. However, the kind of discussion we just had around this virtual table is exactly the kind of discussion and feedback we're looking for from the public. And rather than discounting something out of the gate, now I think it's better for us to go out and get that feedback and then have the hard discussion later. I do anticipate some pushback on this um, because it will create a series of a, a very large number of non-conforming situations and a much greater workload for the planning department. But if that's the direction uh, the township wants to go, then that has to be reconciled later on as well too. So I, I would suggest leaving it in with an addition dealing with other standards and let's see what the public comes back with on this. That would be my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Just a, a word of clarification for, for me anyway. Uh, when this goes out to the public, do we let them understand what the consequences of this are from the planning department, from the, does the whole picture go out to them? I think is what I'm asking you. I think, I think I, that's a very good comment because it, it goes to how we present this document later on uh, to the public and, and, and we do think that there's a need for a discussion around the policy direction, something similar to what's in the right hand column. And I think we would add in something in here that says the implication of this will be that many existing properties will no longer comply with the bylaw, um, which means that any uh, alterations or changes on those properties would require a minor variance, which means increased workload. So we have no problem adding that because that would be a fact, uh, clearly, as a consequence. So we would we would certainly make that clear to folks. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gathering that we are finished with this one and you'd like to move on to the next one? Yes, that would be great. So next one is recreational carrying capacity. Um, so again, um, related obviously to the discussion we just had, um, so we made a few additions to this. Um, so we had initially indicated that the RCC model be used as a guideline for consideration uh, based on the discussions we had in the last session. Uh, sessions uh, included in item A is that the RCC model would be used as a hard cap on small and medium sized lakes. And if there are questions on what that actually means, uh, Mr. Diamond would be happy to answer that. Uh, we included a new item B uh, that dealt with the concern about uh, the larger lakes and it, it now says that the RCC would be used as a guideline to consider when new development in the form of law creation and commercial development on large lakes where there are specific bays and channels that function in a manner that is similar to an independent water body. So we would be including policies on that as well. Um, we identified a new item C. Uh, there already are lake planning policies in your official plan. Uh, they're quite good, uh, but we thought it was important uh, to reinforce uh, the idea that lake plans are a great way of dealing with, uh, with local lake issues. Um, and we would continue to support that uh, with a component of lake planning, including 
uh, consideration of uh, recreational carrying capacity as well. So those are the changes we made to that policy direction based on the feedback received. Any comments on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, before we get to comments, because I know we have a number of our, our um, constituents listening in today, maybe Mr. Diamond, you could just clarify the hard cap on the small lakes, just so everybody understands what we're talking about. Right. So, and we'll take you back to the background studies where we found that most of the small and mid-sized lakes, save and except for some of the lakes that are in the more remote areas of the township, uh, would be considered at very near or over capacity based on the standard recreational carrying capacity model. Um, so that would essentially mean um, on those lakes, uh, no new lot creation and zoning regulations uh, for existing um, ex for expansions to existing commercial uses, if there are any, um, that would limit um, docking facilities and uh, other facilities that would enable um, greater use of the surface area of the lake for recreational purposes. So the effect of the policy change is really to put um, a new and significant uh, limitation on development on those uh, medium and small lakes that are over capacity now. Um, then again, just to follow up from what Mr. McDonald said, that um, those, those policies and potential regulations brought through zoning um, would be considered for the parts of the larger lakes that really function as um, more or less independent water bodies. And I think I gave the example of Little Lake Joe where it's, uh, it's connected to Lake Joe, but it really does function as a separate water body. And so that when development applications were considered on those uh, bare areas of bays and um, uh, significant small portions of the lakes, the RCC uh, concepts would be considered by planning staff, planning committee and council when reviewing the applications. Okay, thank you. That's um, that's great. That makes it clear, I believe, for everybody. So, Councillor Roberts, I believe you have a comment. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, recreation carrying capacity. I guess I want to start with uh, item D um, that was listed there in, in the very last sentence before the bullets, and it, it, as, as it talks about uh, according to, with, with the with the RC. C calculation in order to preserve the enjoy, enjoyment of the lake. It's much more than that. I would like to see a few words added to the last part of that, preserve and protect the enjoyment of the lake as well as lake health. Because it's much more than the, the, the large invasive species called humans who are destroying the lakes, not just, and uh, we need to protect our environment. So. We need a carrying capacity, not, not something that just focuses on enjoyment and recreation. The, um, on the point B, including policies that apply the RCC model as a guideline, and you, take it and, and you read on and say, in small bay, on specific bays, um, you know, we've talked about large lakes and that throws you off, but the guideline on these small bays should be treated as small lakes. And the township should be specifying what these small um, has some criteria to small to specify what, where these small bays are, and that they will fall under the hard cap recreation carrying capacity. The only other thing I have is on point C at the very bottom, and uh, Mr. Pink can correct me if I am wrong, but it says recreation carrying capacity with the lake plans being incorporated into the OP by way of an OPA in the future. I, it's my understanding that lake plans are part of this official plan review and will are not an OP amendment. So we're not waiting for the future. We have a few lakes that, are, that have been working diligently, come up with the lake plans and expect them to be part of this official plan review. So we've got to strike out OPA um, in the future. Comments? Um, Mr. Pink, can you? comment on that, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, 
I think that, uh, and Mr. McDonald can confirm, I, I think that's just standard wording that certainly after the OPA review is completed, there may still be late plans in the future and the way to incorporate those would be an OPA. This wouldn't in any way close the door to a late coming to us now uh, as I'm expecting a few to be included in an OPA review as could be done in the next OPA review 10 years from now. Um, I think it's just sort of boilerplate wording. Uh, if I can say, Madam Chair, that was our thought as well. Um, and if I, I'll speak again to uh, uh, the councillor's comment on defining the small bays and things, we had talked about that as uh, as planners that we need to do that in the policy so that there that we have um, uh, the specific criteria that Councillor Roberts was talking about in the official plan to identify where um, where the small bays and the smaller portions of lakes could be uh, subject to the RCC uh, policies. Okay. And I think, I think as well, just to add to that too, um, that the reason why we're using the word guideline uh, with the larger bays is that they're not closed systems. And I think personally, I think it's, it would be challenging to establish uh, the first principle that they'll be that the RCC model will be used as a hard cap in every one of those circumstances. And that's why we're using guidelines. So Mr. Diamond's basically saying that in the policy framework, we would set out uh, the process under which we would characterize whether a small bay uh, should have some kind of cap uh, applied to it. But that's a, that's a future uh, thing to do and, and not something we can do in advance. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to, um, Councillor Roberts, do you have a supplemental? Yeah, supplemental, just very quickly. I'm encouraged by that, but sometime in the future, but I think it's got to be during this OP process review that we come up with some formula that, that handles these small bays. Like I understand they have a lot of people coming in, a lot of boat traffic and a lot of use, but there's got to be a way that when we go to OPAT, we, we recognize that, or no, um, that, um, that we recognize this, but this this bay is in, in, in is threatened. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Oh, thank you very much. Um, further to small lakes and that uh, and association is doing lake plans. You know, I've had had feedback from someone, and they say like the, the the cost is exorbitant, and I don't. I think that we should be. Um, reaching out to them uh, to help us rather than, than uh, penalizing them on that. I don't know what the answer is at this time, but I have had talks with, with two lake associations and they're saying we just can't afford an extra three or four thousand dollars for these. So uh, I think if they, they bring them forward now, we should look at them and help in, uh, to actually incorporate them and that they know best what they want for their lake. So, you know, that's what I my two cents worth. Thank you. Um, Member Arnie? Thank you, Councillor Bridgman. I would, uh, first of all, to the um, consultants, like to restate your comment about uh, ensuring that the implications of the hard cap are made clear in the presentation to the public, that people will know um, Recreational carrying capacity is not my favorite tool. So I, I think people should know what the implications are. And further to uh, Councillor Roberts' comment about um, recreational purposes and, and enjoyment, I would like to see cumulative Im impacts included in this process of recreational carrying capacity. As I said, I, I have to admit I'm not a fan and I'm not an expert, but um, I do think that cumulative impacts should be starting to be recognized throughout, just, just as climate change impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Uh, thank you. Um, I was under the impression that the RCC was going to be included in our toolbox of things that we reviewed uh, when we reviewed a, a development on a lake, not that it was going to be the only thing that we looked at and it was going to be a hard cap. 
Um, there are lots of small and medium lakes out there and they've indicated that nearly all of them would have no development and they are all very diverse. And I don't think you can use one specific tool and only one tool to put a hard cap on all of our smaller lakes. Um, I was looking for more of a toolbox approach than one specific thing. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Lundell. Thank you. Um, what uh, we did have the benefit of being able to view during our early working group meetings was a table that was produced by the consultants to list various lakes that would be considered at capacity now. And um, I'm not sure that everyone had received that, but there were approximately 40% of these small to medium sized lakes that would still be available for a further lot creation. So it's not um, indeed, uh, and there are a number of lakes that would still allow a lot creation, approximately 40% of those on the table that we received. Thank you. Um, Member Clark. Um, just reiterating again, I mean, I agree if lakes are, we're using a, a hard cap with RCC um, and David, maybe you can help. I think I've asked you this before. I believe they just completed a 10 year study on what the health of most of Ontario lakes were at. Um, I, I may be mistaken, but it was, it's been recently done. My understanding is all lakes had improved. So using one metric instead of using science uh, doesn't seem to make sense to me. We also do water testing on multiple parts of lakes. So I could imagine certain lakes that have, uh, you know, swampy areas, shallow areas where blue green algae may form, things like that could certainly have a hard cap and not and not be developable. Uh, that's a word. Um, but locking an entire lake down, again, we talk about rural properties and not being able to create lots and all kinds of things that these have enormous financial impacts to people as well. I understand the the environment's a priority, but using one item instead of watershed, instead of studies, instead of having people come in, they'll bring data and they'll bring consultants and they will, you'll just end up at LPAT again. So um, I, I, I think we just have to be realistic that you're not gonna be able to use one metric because that one metric happens to suit the cause. Thank you. Madam Chair, Jim Diamond, if I can speak to that, I'm sorry, I can't raise my hand because I'm on a phone link. Um, I, I, I want to make sure that the, um, that the, the committee recognizes the fact that the recreational carrying capacity is not the only factor that would be considered. Um, and it's it, the recreational carrying capacity is a social impact factor. It relates to the reasonable enjoyment of our shared, um, open space, that being the surface of the lake. It's quite separate and distinct from environmental qualities, although I agree with Councillor Roberts that there are environmental impacts that are brought on by recreational carrying capacity. For example, large wakes of wakeboards cause greater erosion on the shoreline and wash uh, sediment, which contains nutrients into the lake. That's an environmental impact of the recreational use of the lake. But they're two very separate and distinct uh, criteria that, that need to be considered. Um, and, and we need to keep that in our minds when we're talking about it in this way. Um, maybe I could get clarification, Mr. Diamond. It says here, hard cap. That says to me that it is it would be the deciding factor on these small lakes. Could you clarify that for me, please? That's, that's correct. That's what the policy direction is. Um, but one... Uh, one factor doesn't uh, isn't the only factor we would consider um, where there's a, a situation where there's um, a recreational carrying capacity issue. There may be no environmental issues at all on the lake, um, but it doesn't mean we don't pay attention to the environmental issues too. Uh, but you're quite right. Um, even if the water quality is perfect, if there are more uh, units around the shoreline than what the recreational carrying capacity would be, it would be a hard cap and it would require at least an official plan amendment to allow further development on those lakes. 
Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, having just experienced the Moon River yesterday, uh, I'm fortunate to be on a large lake, uh, Lake Muskoka. What I saw yesterday, and I wanna use the word health, was incredible. The crush of humanity, the 20, and I have one, 25 foot boats on a river that in some places is 150 feet across with massive wakes, people water skiing, sea doing, uh, so, you know, everything. Um, I mean, I, I think we, I, I heard us talking about health and I, I think there's a human health factor to all of this as well as the health of the lake. It's, it's the overall experience of Muskoka. If what I saw yesterday, and we have two members, uh, you know, on this committee that are on the Moon River, you guys are experiencing that blue boat and that red boat and that orange boat. Wow, the, the weight that that puts on our, our, you know, infrastructure, the, the, the between the docks, the, the lakes, the, the, you know, it's a problem. It's a, this is a socioeconomic huge problem. And I'm wondering how we factor it in. It's more information than anything, but I experienced it firsthand. And it's, you know, here on Lake Muskoka, there, there's room to breathe. There's, there's large parts of the lake. There are some small bays, but this is a river. And this is a long river and it's in our township. And wow, I'm surprised given what I saw yesterday that we haven't heard more about this because it's, it's about as bad as it can be as far as I've seen in terms of weight and potential uh, damage. Thank you. Okay, th uh, thank you, Councillor Zavitz. I'm, I'm not sure how that would factor into this. Maybe Mr. McDonald or Mr. Diamond could comment on that. I'm happy to weigh in, Madam Chair. Um, I, I believe what Councillor Zavitz is talking about is the amount of boat traffic on the water body, which the municipality, even the province, has no authority to regulate. It's a federal, a matter of fe federal regulation. The only thing we can do as a municipality is regulate the shoreline development that um, encourages the use of the water body. Uh, so the municipality, district, the province have no authority whatsoever to regulate the size of vessels, the speed that they travel, um, how close they go to the shoreline. Uh, none of that is within the jurisdiction of the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Thank you. Very frustrating, but thank you. Um, okay, Member Clark. Sorry, so just a couple of things. Jim, all due respect, um, uh, Madam Chair asked a question about the RCC model and read the comments and we gave a great sort of felt like a political answer. <laughs> um, the reality is it does say a hard cap. Your uh, follow on discussion was, well, no, it's only part of the discussion. And we kind of left that. And our wording here is that it's a hard cap. Um, so, you know, if I'm a member of the public and I say, hey, my RCC model is going to be my hard cap, I don't think I'm really going to care what else is going on if I'm one of the people that is uh, anti-development. Um, so I do think that wording uh, needs to be uh, reflective. We've had at least three people say, hey, it's part of our toolbox, it's part of our consideration. You have said... It's, it's one of the items and yet item A says it's a hard cap. And, you know, I don't think that's wordsmithing. I think it's misleading. Um, but I, I guess <laughs> the other part of that discussion was uh, just on this boat traffic thing. I, I mean, we do have laws and regulations. And again, we just continue to come back to bylaw enforcement or not, or to enforcement issues. Um, you're, you're restricted to a 9.9 .9 kilometer uh, speed, 100 feet off of shore. So if somebody's shooting through uh, 150 foot uh, opening at, at speed, then it probably needs to be signed and enforced. Thank you. So if I can, uh, I can jump in uh, at this point, um, based on the discussions we, we had in the last meeting, we certainly were left with the impression that the majority view, and, and, and we're not taking votes on this stuff, I realize, was that there be a hard cap. 
So it is worded uh, because that's the impression we were left with. If there is a desire uh, for this to be a consideration amongst others uh, when determining whether lock creation is, is, is a good idea or not on small and medium lakes, that's a different policy direction. Um, so we need some clarity on that uh, going forward. Um, and again, I'm not sure, uh, I, I'm sure there will be no consensus on this point. Um, but again, keeping in mind, the purpose of all of this is to go out and get feedback. And we may still decide in the end that maybe a hard cap is not a good idea, but we need to get that input first before we get there. I see member Clark would like to speak again. Sorry, I'm gonna be a bit of a dog on a bone here. So. Um, now we're back to saying it's a hard cap and it's the only consideration. So I'm assuming we're gonna to explain to the public at the time of these meetings that the RCC model is flawed in certain sections. It's not used in a lot of areas because it has flaws. Are, are we gonna explain all of this or, you know, uh, are we going to use a model that we all agree it doesn't work in certain areas and um, it's probably not the only tool that should be used. I guess in response, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Diamond, but uh, Mr. Diamond made it fairly clear last time that if the municipality decides on using this model um, and it's being properly vetted and considered, it becomes defensible at the end of the day if it is equally applied to all small and medium lakes in the township. When you don't do that, that's when you start running into problems. Uh, but I'll ask Mr. Diamond to comment on that. Thanks. The, um, just to try to clarify, the policy direction that we've been provided by the committee is to make it a hard cap on the small and medium-sized lakes. Um, and so I guess in that in, to make it simple is if the lake is over capacity from a recreational carrying capacity model perspective, um, then that's it. Um, there would be uh, no new lots would be permitted um, and uh, no rezoning applications would be uh, in accordance with or keeping with the policies of the official plan if they added um, recreational uses to the waterfront. Um, on the larger bodies where we're suggesting it be a guideline, the recreational carrying capacity would be considered in conjunction with all of the other matters in the official plan, including water quality, um, character, all of those other things, uh, the RCC would be a criteria like everything else. Okay, so I, um, I'm i not sure if the feeling now is to not even put it out there. My sense is there's a lot of people out there who want to at least be able to express their opinion on this. That would be my take on it, as long as, as uh, Member Clark said, and I would agree, when this goes out to the public, it really needs a column that says, here, here, here are the effects of what we're talking about. So that would be my comment. And I see that Member Thompson would like to speak. Uh, yes, no, I would just like to, I concur with what you say. I think we should go out to the public with this. Um, the RCC is a proxy for uh, too much development on the lake. And or when you're over the RCC, it's a proxy for that. And um, and if you don't have that, and you just have some of the other factors, then chances are you'll end up with studies that say that all you have to do is move your cottage back a bit and have a few more waterfront buffers and put your septic over there, and then you can build more. And that doesn't, but building more, um, it means that you're likely going to have more activity on that lake. And so the, the proxy for, um, uh, determining how much activity makes sense to have on the lake is an RCC and it has been used with success in a lot of municipalities. And so I don't think we, I don't, I don't think saying it's, it is flawed is, is fair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, for the time being, I would leave it in and see what the public has to say on this. Um, you know, We've, we've gone to uh, LPAT on um, resorts and everything else like that. And what they're saying is our, our uh, policies aren't, aren't 
uh, strict enough and that's how they, they, people get around them. So if you make them strict, you can always relax them, but uh, you, you can't go and say, well, this is what we thought. You have to either do it or, or, uh, or, or leave it wide open. So I would see, see what the public has to say on this. Thank you. Okay, Member Clark. I promise to drop it after this. <laughs> I agree to go to the public. I absolutely believe there's going to be, there needs to be a lot of clarification behind this because what I keep hearing out of these things is that we're driving to very specific goals uh, by individuals. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can't sit there and say recreational carrying capacity is going to be what we use as a hard cap, but oh, that doesn't work in, the, in Wallace Bay. Um, because it's a flawed plan, but it works on all the other things we want it to work on. Um, so I, I don't think, and, and by the way, that was part of our discussion. We said it does not work on large lakes. It, and the reason it doesn't work on large lakes is because the formulas don't work. But it's convenient that it works on small lakes. So let's, you know, we're, we're going to sort of apply it where we like it to be applied. And oh, by the way, now we're going to say, We'll take a specific day and treat it like a small lake. Either either have some science that backs it, or like you're going to be lawyering up every single time. And we we simply don't have the resources. So um, just some practicality behind it. Thank you. Well, that certainly comes into play when we get down to the hard decisions after we hear what the public. Uh, has to say, et cetera, would be my comment. But Mr. McDonald, are you yep. good with this at this point? Yeah, so the, the one thing we're gonna add is, uh, is a clear description of what the implications of a hard cap uh, are, um, and with particular reference to perhaps even the, the names of the lakes that may be affected. We'll, we'll think about how that uh, can be accomplished. But uh, to, to the last point that was made, that's why we, we, we don't, Think it's a good idea to apply a hard cap to, to the large bays and the large or the bays on the larger lakes for, for that very reason. We've got closed systems and we have open systems, and that's why there's a difference. But I'm I I, I would recommend that we continue um, going out uh, with this idea and see what the feedback is, um, and then have the hard discussion later about whether this is a good idea or not. Okay, thank you. I see Councillor Roberts, you want one more comment on this section? Yes, one more very quick. If we're going to identify the negative side of a hard cap, we've got must on the other side, identify the positive of what will come out of a hard cap. You just can't have both sides. All right, because I've listened to it all. I'm going to stop because uh, I've just Fair comment. Appreciate that comment. And I think we already have something in there about what the purpose of the RCC is, but we'll, we'll make sure that there, that balance is provided. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the next one. Uh, flooding hazards on lake uh, lakes number three. Um, nothing really different in terms of the approach, uh, but what we did uh, is uh, be a little bit more specific about what the policy direction means again. Uh, and this is probably more of a zoning discussion than an official plan discussion, uh, but official plans do uh, set direction that zoning bylaws are required to follow. So we included some words to that effect. We also included some ideas uh, for consideration through a future zoning review. So item A, uh, include policies that direct the zoning bylaw to include provisions that require updated provisions on the minimum elevation of certain openings, uh, openings meaning windows and doors, uh, the second story um, and the base of the stairs accessing the second story of boathouses to make sure that they're over a certain elevation and can be accessible uh, in terms of uh, uh, during a flooding event. So again, you know what those standards are would not be established in the official plan, but we would be uh, setting a direction that they be established as part of the zoning bylaw review. Uh, turning over to item C, again, uh, include policies that direct the updated zoning model to prohibit uses uh, beyond the storage of boats in the first story of a boathouse. Again, 
That's much more of a zoning discussion than an official plan discussion. A zoning bylaw is applicable law, an official plan is not. Uh, item D, include policies directly updated zoning bylaw, again, uh, to prohibit uh, storage of any kind of hazardous materials below uh, 0.5 meters of the flood elevation determined by the updated floodplain mapping. Uh, we've, re we've retained the item E, which is requiring site plan approval, uh, but we uh, removed uh, any thought, or we removed the thought for now of including consideration that there be acknowledgement that the, uh, through such a process that the boathouse may be impacted by future flooding events. We're not sure that's enforceable or is doable under the Planning Act, so we've taken that out. So the changes are quite minor in this section. They're much more directory in terms of um, kind of flipping this to the zoning bylaw for future consideration. Well, that's all I have on this one. Okay, thank you. Well, I see member Scalati, some comments? Uh, yes, I just wonder if uh, we're also gonna be sending out definitions along with these, uh, these policies and suggestions because I'm specifically concerned about the, the term high watermark. It seems to be quite a fluid uh, piece of information and is interpreted differently by different people, particularly surveyors. So I'm just wondering if this, there is going to be a definition section in here that will tell us exactly what a high watermark means. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good point, and and it and and it's definitely way beyond this discussion. Uh, but I can tell you that in other jurisdictions, they're moving towards establishing a fixed elevation, um, and then surveyors have to figure out where that is on a lot, and setbacks and openings are then dealt with in that way. Much preferable than using high water mark. I would agree. Um, However, that's a much more detailed conversation, I think, that would need to be had uh, through the zoning bylaw review process that comes after the OP. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Arnie? Thank you, Chair Bergman. Um, my first comment is for point E, site plan approval for new or expanded, renovated or restored boathouse, I think, should be added in there. I'm also a little concerned in this policy and I know it reflects the discussion because as soon as the floodplain issue came up, boathouses became the main topic. But I don't see much in policy in relation to, similar to David's comment about high watermark, about the implications of the new floodplain mapping where we have it. What, what are we going to do with buildings that are there now in a floodplain? Um, if they want to expand or develop, what are we going to do with lots that don't have much area left because they're identified as floodplain, but they are legal building lots. Um, I'm concerned that this is an area that we just didn't deal with. I don't blame the consultants. Yeah, that was the discussion, but um, I'm wondering if either maybe David would have some input there as to thoughts he might have or if the consultants would suggest. Um, of course, we would like, would prefer that there be regulations A, not to build or expand, or B, to make sure that the buildings um, or expansions recognize the, the floodplain issue and are resilient enough to withstand it. Thank you. So, so I'll start off with an answer and perhaps uh, Mr. Pink can, can add in. Um, shoreline structures uh, are permitted within floodplains provided uh, that they're not habitable uh, and considered to be habitable. So there will be implications certainly of, of the floodplain mapping uh, on that. Uh, the floodplain mapping we've seen uh, is, is quite significant in that it will have an impact on the developability and development potential of a number of properties. And I'm going to suggest that that's more of a zoning discussion in terms of what impact that will have on developability. Certainly the floodplain mapping will come into play in any Planning Act uh, application process, such as a site plan 
or, or a minor variance or a rezoning and, they'll, and that'll happen immediately. But in terms of longer term impacts, I agree with you, they're, they're, they are significant. And I have to add that if we uh, layer in the new floodplain mapping with increased setbacks as discussed, that compounds uh, the issue in terms of creating legal nonconformity and pushing buildings even further back. So, so we understand that there's a lot of stuff at play here. Um, and hopefully over the next few months, we'll get a better handle on the implications of the floodplain mapping. But your point is well taken. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pink, do you want to add to that? You don't need to? No, you don't. No. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, Councillor Hayes? Um, thank you. Through you, uh, could uh, D go on further to say no storage of any kind below one meter between Thanksgiving and May first, because we talk about um, materials that are non-hazardous, but anything floating in our lakes during flood time is a hazard. Uh, also, could we find somewhere to put in that there will be no wiring? Uh, less than a meter off the uh, bottom of the boathouse. And we also talked about a uh, notice being given of possible flooding events at the issuance of a building permit. And I don't think that has to be in the OP, but just uh, it's something to remember. Thank you. Uh. I think in response, a quick response is, uh, and I, I recognize now I probably should have done, should not have done this, but when I start putting numbers in an official plan, uh, then we, this ends up being a numbered discussion. I'm thinking I would pro I would change D to say that storage of uh, materials within an appropriate distance of the elevation, because I quite frankly don't know what the number should be, and I don't think we should we should be going out and saying what it is right off the top. But I, I agree with the sentiment. Um, and, and, and I'm going to suggest we take the number out because that's a much more detailed discussion and perhaps left to the zoning bylaw review that comes later. Um, about the wiring, I'd have to think about that, uh, but again, I'm not sure that needs to be in the official plan. Uh, if I can speak, um, Madam Chair, for a second, um, I think that the part, um, Part D also plays into the consideration of the fact that the lakes in the Township of Muskoka Lakes are a significant source of drinking water for a lot of residents and that there's an element of um, protection of the water quality for drinking water purposes by preventing hazardous materials from being stored uh, in an area where they could potentially end up in the lake. And I, I think that that's kind of a, a rationale a little bit for this policy. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Member Clark? Um, just a few things. Uh, I, and I don't understand, you know, I'll just say I don't, um, uh, don't know where we are in this floodplain mapping, but in the last six years, uh, I'm on Rosso, uh, the maximum I saw the water go over my dock and most of my clients was sort of six to eight inches. On Lake Muskoka, I had teams of people cutting roofs out of boathouses uh, to get their boats out. Um, so I don't know when we're getting this specific, are we going to be specifically talking about what we're going to do for each of these lakes? Because Rosso, Joe, uh, were clearly different than Muskoka. And, and I also listened to... Uh, uh, member Scalati, you know, with his eight feet of difference on the Moon River, um, you know, there's obviously got to be some specific things happening there. And are we talking about a worst case scenario? I don't think 0.5 meters makes, uh, you know, <laughs> we're talking much larger numbers of what we've actually seen. Um, as it relates to the building code or what's allowed, I think we better uh, I would listen to the last uh, member's comments about wiring uh, any other items being put into these boathouses that um, they should be up higher. Uh, it is a risk. Um, it's just uh, intelligent building or practical that you don't want your wiring, et cetera, underwater. And until we get our arms around this, um, 
we, you know, we should probably put some things in to safeguard. My last comment is on C, which seems to be again, sort of a, a pet peeve going on here. Um, I don't understand this whole business of uh, habitable space versus non-habitable space. As a builder, my understanding of habitable space slash storage in, uh, or sorry, habitable space in a lower boathouse means that there's a bedroom and living space. Uh, it does not mean that there's sitting areas, lounges, et cetera. And I'll just caution the committee that every single boathouse that's being applied for right now, you should take a look at what's being built. They all have habitable space. And I'd love to know what the major concern about this is considering what the uh, building code makes us do for septic systems, et cetera, in these areas. Um, and the second part that I would say to you is I, I, I think gas cans and boats and all the other stuff we have down there are a lot more hazardous than a, than a, a chair floating out and the people that are building these things, uh, they, they are not having their stuff floating through doors and going out into the lake. They have staff and property managers that deal with things. So just again, there seems to be a disconnect. I don't get the difference between sitting on my dock with a whole pile of furniture, sitting under a shaded area with a whole pile of furniture, or sitting on top of a flat top boathouse, why any of those are a difference. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McDonald, do you want to? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I didn't put my hand up, but you knew I wanted to talk, say something. <laughs> That's good. Um, good. Those are good comments. And I, I, th I think the basic planning principle is that habitable space uh, means it's being occupied in some way by, by people. And they should not be uh, in a, that space should not be in a location that could be affected by a flooding event such that those people could be harmed. I mean, that's that's the planning principle, but I agree with you that, that there, there are a lot of ways to look at it. I do know from reviewing your bylaw that there are specific definitions for habitable floor space and boat houses. Um, so again, I would uh, defer to David on this particular point, but I think more importantly, this is more of a zoning bylaw discussion than an official plan discussion at this point. Mr. Pink? Uh, just to refresh uh, committee members' uh, uh, memories, um, uh, it's a good uh, good discussion and good topic. Thanks for raising it. I agree with all of your points, Bob. And staff did recognize, I think right now, uh, the zoning bylaw is very clear. We don't allow any habitable space in the first story of a boathouse. So um, fair discussion or point, uh, Mr. Clark, about whether the appropriateness of that or not. And staff brought forward a report uh, suggesting two options, whether we uh, make that clear that that's no longer permitted use because we are experiencing that um, realistically in the field uh, and reviewing building permits. It does appear like that's what's occurring um, or the alternative and making it uh, clear and, and closing that ability. Uh, committee had a lengthy discussion and no direction was provided to staff uh, to address the issue. So uh, if you recall, again, staff prepared a lengthy report uh, outlining some of the advantages and disadvantages of both of those approaches and no direction was given. So it is largely a zoning bylaw issue. Our zoning bylaw currently prohibits it. Um, however, we're struggling with being able to enforce it uh, because the permits show open space and we know furniture is then going in afterwards and we're struggling with, uh, with enforcing that. So just provide a bit of background for our committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just very quickly, on the discussion side of, of, the, um, of the flooding, the very last paragraph, it, it states approval process to reduce the risk to public health, safety, property damage. And, I, and if this is going out to the public, I'd like to have Lake Health in there. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Member Lundell. Uh, thank you. I understand, of course, that a lot of this is driven by provincial policy and then Muskoka official plan policy. Um, but I was looking at the required site plan approval for every new or expanded boathouse. And I'm wondering if that would also apply to other types of accessory structures. Mr. McDonald. Um, 
I guess in reply, uh, no, we haven't uh, included that in here. Typically, um, and again, I would defer to David uh, Pink uh, and, and his comments on when site plan approval is triggered, but typically it's when main buildings are being constructed or expanded. And we're suggesting that boathouses be added to the mix. I'm not sure renovations would and should trigger a site plan approval process, but that's for discussion later. Uh, but Mr. Pink, what are the rules on accessory buildings? Mr. Pink? Uh, currently, the zoning bylaw only allows docks, boathouses, and sun shelters over water. Uh, currently, the site plan control bylaw uh, does not require a site plan agreement when any of those are redeveloped. So this would be a new initiative, and Council should be cognizant uh, that requiring every new or expanded boathouse to go through that process will potentially increase the number of site plan applications significantly. Um, it was uh, specifically excluded by the previous council in the site plan bylaw, uh, as most of the issues we were dealing with were stormwater management and vegetation related, which obviously both houses do not uh, impact. So it was a uh, cognizant decision of the previous council to not include both houses. Um, so that would be a change and there will be, as I say, significant uh, workload implications related to that. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, I'm Mayor Harding and then I'll go to you, Councillor Edwards. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just want to factor in and make sure we are identifying all this. And as we look at restricting even more so uses within boathouses and open air spaces, and we talk about the health and lake health, um, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic where our residents' health is also important. And, and I had a neighbor who has, uh, 1200 square foot cottage, nothing major, but they eat these days in the boathouse and especially when they have people over because it's more open air. The front door, there's one deck, one dock uh, that's decked in and they've moved their activities there so that they are more open. As we spread a virus, like we're living with this for the next few years or lifetime, our habits have changed we may want to be considering what are we doing with are we forcing people more indoors or are we going to try and create some more out there open space areas in this and i just I, I flagged this because again when we take away kind of like um appliances and washing machines whatever now i have to go upstairs now i have to go clean things other ways uh, i agree from a flooding perspective but we need to factor that into this whole development as well it's a reality Hey, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards? Uh, yes, you know, it, it, it's funny because I always thought it said boathouse, period. We let them put some storage in. We let them put other things in. Now they're making party rooms. I went up uh, to Lake uh, just last weekend and it had to be 35 people, not social distancing, out on, a, out on their boathouse inside. But the thing is this, if you put washrooms downstairs, you're pumping it from there. So you, you, you have, have that problem. And um, I think the, the, the 50 square feet for storage and everything else like that, when you, you, when you actually look at a, a 66 foot dock and 75 feet wide, and that, that gives you 4,950 square feet. And we're worried about pushing a cottage back to 30 meters, that's where the problem is, right on the water. So we should be looking at it. I don't know what the answer is, is what people want, but we should be looking at, at uh, boathouses. That's what they used to be, is a boathouse. Thank you. So Member Clark, I'm sure you'll have a comment on that. Well, <laughs> um, you know, I. I just, I find it fascinating. Um, first of all, septics in a lower boathouse aren't a problem. Uh, septics in a lower boathouse are sealed units that pump up a hill. Uh, the materials we use in a lower boathouse are actually uh, certified higher standard than most of the boathouses that we look at in our coffee table books. Um, the old boathouses down on Lake Muskoka had living spaces, had party rooms, had dining areas. And I'm not, I'm not being antagonistic. I just am asking 
what is the difference between me having 500 square feet with chairs and a table and a place to sit out of the sun versus 500 square feet on my dock versus 500 square feet on the roof of my dock. It doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. And by the way, take it away and I'll put two slips in and we'll have a recreational carrying capacity problem. So, you know, like you have to understand the more restrictive you get, this, you, you need to hire some really good architects to write your bylaws because I'm looking at what people are building right now. We're allowed to do two-story open spaces. We're allowed to do all kinds of things that change over time. And we have no enforcement ability, which is what David's saying. I think, you know, what we keep missing here is where does David need help? Where does his team need help? And he went to you guys with this issue and got no clear direction, right? So guess what? No clear direction, it continues on. And guess what? Let's have a clear direction that isn't what people want and they'll hire a really expensive architect to work his way around it and they'll do it. So, um, you know, right now we lease uh, our, our single story boathouse. As soon as we put a bathroom in, we lease the crown land. All right, so I don't know what legal implications there are of that, but the bylaws, et cetera, allow us to put a bathroom in a lower level. Is a bathroom habitable space? So, um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of things to consider. Tell me how you're gonna enforce it with the hundreds of these things out there. Tell me you're gonna go do that to all the old boathouses down on Lake Muskoka and the ones that have these spaces. Um, and then also understand if you take it away, what's gonna replace it. Thank you. Okay, so this is really interesting, but I think we're getting a little off our, our topic uh, this morning and what our, and our objectives. And I don't mean to minimize it, but I think we need to stay on course here. And Councillor Jagowitz, if you were gonna comment on the last discussion, can you hold it until we bring it back to another meeting and, and can focus exactly on this? If you've got another comment, obviously very welcome. Uh, thank you. My comment was it was very brief. Uh, I have, I have uh, family in Australia, and these things are called boat sheds. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if we're good, Mr. McDonald, I'd like to call a 10-minute uh, break and uh, so that we can just all charge our coffees, et cetera, et cetera. And then we will be back. Uh, I've got 20 to 11, so we'll be back at 10 to 11. Okay. Great. Good. Okay. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, welcome back everybody and we will continue on. Um, we're, we've only got just over an hour left and I know you've got a lot left on your list, Mr. McDonald. So um, I guess we'll just try to speed this up and understand that we're not looking for details here. We're just looking for policy directions. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I echo those comments. I'll try to get through the remaining uh, policy directions as quickly as possible. I'm going to touch on uh, item number four. Uh, this one deals with natural heritage. I think simply we were recommending last time that we uh, incorporate and carry forward the policies of the district's plan as it relates to natural heritage. But there was a lot of discussion on this point last time, so we went unpack that and gone further. Uh, and we've included uh, a new item uh, B and C. Item B indicates that uh, policies would be included within the official plan uh, that would support uh, the development of a local natural heritage system that identifies locally important natural heritage features and areas. This would definitely be a separate study uh, done as a separate item at some point in the future, but the official plan could set that up. And then lastly, uh, we've included uh, a suggestion, suggestion that we include policies in the, in the official plan that establish the uh, basis and criteria for identifying vegetation protection zones around uh, certain features. Um, in some parts of Ontario, there are mandated uh, vegetation protection zone requirements. I'm not sure that's the way to go all the time but I'm, I do think that there's a need for some policy direction on establishing those uh, through future processes and planning applications. So I'm hoping these changes are relatively straightforward, um, but those are the changes we made in response to comments received. Okay, thank you. Member Arnie. Thank you, Chairman Richmond. I have two uh, very quick comments. We discussed the fact that the mapping is going to be a huge financial uh, implication. I would like to include maybe a policy direction that the council be encouraged to collaborate with other jurisdictions in order to make this mapping happen. Um, I'll be speaking to that more when we get to the watershed planning. And in B, um, to include the development of large natural heritage system through a study that identifies natural heritage areas and such areas should include consideration of preservation of corridors for significant wildlife. Um, we've talked a lot about the environment, but only really the water. And there is a need to analyze our natural heritage areas in order to protect some land area in order to maintain that um, priority of the environment because there's more than the water on the environment. Thank you. A quick, resp quick response to that. Uh, yes, uh, we do see whatever mapping gets done to be a collaborative exercise. And I don't think we need to mention it here. And yes, every natural heritage system includes linkages um, and corridors uh, as a component. So that's, that's an intrinsic part of any natural heritage system. Okay, well, I, I think we're good on that one. So, um, okay. Member Clark, just a sec, we'll see. Yeah, just a quick one. I just wanted, uh, was there not something from Liz about trying to establish potentially some areas for certain development on natural heritage. Did I, did I misunderstand that, Liz? I'm just double checking. Um, thank you. If you're speaking about um, when we were in our uh, working group, I talked about character areas based on uh, built and cultural heritage, but that's not natural heritage. But I do think that the final policy addition to deal with uh, character, lake character, uh, probably addresses what you're asking about, Bob. Okay, um, so I think we're good with this one then, Mr. McDonald, if you right. wanna carry on. Yeah, so the next one is uh, number six, watershed planning. Um, so again, we had uh, 
essentially indicated that we should refer to the district's plan uh, in the township's official plan uh, and provide some additional guidance uh, on matters uh, related to quality and quantity of water and so on. We had a good discussion about this last time and given the uh, suggestion made in the previous policy direction about the natural heritage system, we've included a number, item A, include policies that support the development of natural heritage system and water resource system mapping that, include, that, that leads to improved knowledge and the characterization of subwatersheds uh, in TML. Uh, the characterization work uh, is, um, is involved and in depth and will take time and cer certainly is a future item uh, to consider. Um, we also uh, apply, uh, I guess, uh, enhanced uh, item B, talking about enhanced policies on stormwater management that will be applied at the development scale and, and at the site scale through the planning approval process. I believe I indicated last time that the township already does apply enhanced thinking through every site plan approval application, so it wouldn't really be new, but we're talking about codifying it a bit more in the OP. Uh, new item C, including a schedule showing the various sub-watersheds in the township, more for information purposes, but to indicate that there are a number of them. So the changes are quite minor, uh, but they do build upon the uh, changes we made to the natural heritage uh, policy direction. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Arnie. As I uh, forewarned you, uh, integrated watershed management, uh, Watershed Council presented a paper to this committee and to Council uh, on integrated watershed management. It has recently been um, the uh, Muskoka Watershed Advisory Committee for the Muskoka Watershed Initiative was given permission to present in public at the MLA um, AGM recently that the main thrust of the advice to the MECP was um, integrated watershed management. I think at least we should include um, the policy that would support any integrated watershed management initiative that is put forward. Um, I'd just like to see the words in there, I guess. How I also would like in the stormwater management, which I appreciate, and of course will be one of the first uh, targets in that process, um, policies directing green versus gray solutions to infrastructure development, policies encouraging green versus gray, I think it would be worthwhile to improve that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Member Thompson. Uh, yes, um, I, I agree with um, uh, with what Patricia Arnie just said, that we should include integrated watershed management. And um, I also think that uh, we should include one of the recommendations from the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee in this as well, or consider it. And that is that we advocated um, in our recommendations for integrated assessments on large development projects. Uh, so rather than just a list of studies that need to be ticked off and completed, um, those studies would be integrated into a report on the um, effects, the overall effects of the development on, um, on, on the environment and on you know, various social factors as well. And uh, it's called Master Environmental Servicing Plan and, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's adopted in lots of municipalities and very well understood. And, and we have um, some information on that uh, in our recommendations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Member Lundell. Um, thank you. I'm just wondering if this would be an appropriate place in the official plan, since we're talking about the next 20 years, would this be a spot where we should recognize our role in implementing recommendations coming out of the uh, District Watershed Council? And I do support this idea of integrated watershed management. Okay, um, Mr. McDonald, does this, does this uh, fit in here? It, 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 it does and it doesn't, but um, I mean, there are a number of future actions that will have to be taken uh, through time, and some of which may require council input. Um, 
but certainly I can see there are being policies in the official plan that support obviously the activities of the, of the watershed council. I, I think that would be a given in, in any event. Um, I think the other comments that have been made are, 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 are important, yet they're minor and supportive of the direction uh, that we're uh, suggesting. The master environment servicing plan, yes, uh, that, that's a requirement for quite large developments, but certainly could be added to the list of, of required studies and applied and asked for in certain circumstances. So um, I would agree with the comments that have been made so far. Okay, thank you. We have Member Clark. I just uh, support it. Don't see any reason to go beyond what the district um, uh, policy would be. They'll be looking at it in a much broader range with, I'm sure, plenty of studies and uh, lots of oversight, et cetera, um, way beyond our budgetary opportunities, I'm sure. So, um, and I think we also have somebody on council, uh, Patricia, who's in deeply involved in this. So we should probably be listening to a lot of the recommendations that she has versus getting down to, I think we've already tied this one up in individual properties and even started talking about commercial sites, et cetera, and how we're going to deal with it. So, um, you know, uh, sounds like there's lots of work to do on this one. Okay, I think, I think Mr. McDonald, we're on to the next one. Yeah, we're on to the next one. So we're gonna to jump to number 14. Um, permitted uses in agricultural and rural areas. This one's a very, very small change. Um, we talked about there being enhanced permissions in rural areas for a whole variety of uses. And I think the one comment uh, made last time that uh, necessitated a change was to make sure that in doing so, we uh, take into in consideration where they are in relation to waterfront areas. So we've added that. Um, at the end of this policy direction. So I'm hoping that's a very minor change and is uh, supported. Okay, do we have any comments on this or are we, we're all good with this? Great, success. Me <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Member Clark. I, I think we just jumped over community planning permit system and said no change, et cetera. Um, I, I'm not going to spend any time on this other than saying with a pile of these changes that are being proposed, if any of them get accepted, David, you better put your hand up and start talking about how you're going to need help here. So, and getting some of your more simpler uh, amendments and bylaws, et cetera, put through because, or you need a bunch of staff. So you might want to rethink that one. Okay, we'll take that as a comment whenever we're talking about changing anything, David, <laughs> your staff. So there we go. <laughs> okay, Mr. McDonald, I think we're moving okay. on. Yes, moving on to number 17. I think we uh, might have had uh, some of this discussion uh, already. Um, and this deals with regulating uh, site alteration uh, in the waterfront. And so here again is a specific reference to increasing the uh, required setback uh, from the high water mark or an elevation uh, to be discussed uh, from 20 meters to uh, 30 meters. Uh, we do anticipate uh, there being uh, many more minor variance applications if that was implemented. So we, we do uh, think that there is a need for very good policies on how to deal with those minor variance applications. I'm not convinced personally that 30 meters makes sense uh, in every circumstance. Um, I believe that uh, there is a need to look at the context of every property and making a decision, uh, but we are talking about establishing a principle and then allowing for that principle to be buried. And that's essentially what we're talking about. Uh, there was some discussion about uh, blasting. Um, so we've included uh, item C indicating that there would be policies that discourage uh, site alteration through blasting when considering Planning Act applications because that's how we're able to do that. Um, however, if there uh, was a desire to go beyond uh, that and, and uh, apply blasting controls in non-planning act applications, that means a separate blasting bylaw would be required. And that's certainly beyond the scope of the official plan and the official plan review. So that's all we had on that one. All right, could I ask any comments on this one? 
success. Let's move on. Yeah, we pretty well had that discussion already. Um, number 18, uh, water accesses and uh, mainland docking and uh, parking. Um, not many changes, just a bit of editorial uh, changes here. Um, but we did uh, include uh, an item B at the end uh, that basically uh, included some of the sentiments made at the last meeting uh, about including design policies uh, to provide guidance on the siting and waterfront access facilities, uh, including uh, marinas. Um, and uh, item A, we reworded a little bit uh, to ensure that protect uh, that existing water access locations were being protected where feasible, but it's not always feasible, and ensure perpetual access rights for new waterfront lots to ensure that adequate access to the mainland is provided. These changes are quite minor, um, but they were intended to enhance uh, the direction and make it a little bit more clear. And I'm hoping that the, the folks on the call agree. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Would anybody have any comments on this? Uh, it doesn't look like it, so I think we can carry on. Okay, number 19, <clears throat> dealing with the grandfathering of existing development in, in the waterfront. Um, and this is part of the broader discussion about setbacks, um, but there is, uh, there are uh, rules in your current zoning bylaw uh, that attempt to recognize historic development um, through other changes made to setbacks uh, in the past. So for example, the waterfront setback was increased from 35 feet to 50 feet in 1998, and then to six to six feet, which, is, which, which it is now in 2005. And, uh, and I'm sure the same discussion we're having today was, was had at, at, at those times as well in terms of what impact the increased setback has on existing development. And, and without going into too much detail, essentially your zoning bylaw allows for certain things to happen in those uh, setback areas in recognition of the fact that there are many cottages and dwellings already in the setback area. So if the thinking is to establish uh, enhanced uh, policies in waterfront areas, a component of that could be removing the permission for expansions within uh, setback areas or the development of the second of a second story on buildings that exist in those setback areas. Um, I recognize that if, for example, we did go to 30 meters and we did restrict expansions uh, and second stories within the 30 meter setback area, that would be a significant change and, and would mean virtually every application would require a minor variance. I'm not sure that's appropriate. So in, in the discussion, we're indicating that perhaps the uh, permissions within the 20 meter setback area would be removed, but that if we go to 30, that we retain those permissions to recognize existing development. A fairly complex topic, um, and I'm also thinking this is much more of a zoning discussion than an official plan discussion, uh, because it, 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 it does require quite a bit of analysis to determine how many buildings and structures would be impacted. Um, so our thought is that uh, at the very least, we go to the public and suggest that the permissions within the 20 meter setback area be removed. Um, and that we include consideration of policies later or through a zoning review process about what we do if we actually go to 30 meters. I think that's a good discussion and should be dealt with through a zoning process. No matter what happens and if we change any of the existing rules, we do anticipate more minor variances clearly. Uh, so again, we're suggesting that there be um, uh, very detailed and clear policies on how those minor variance applications uh, would need to be dealt with. I'll stress again uh, that I'm not sure an arbitrary 20 meter or 30 meter setback is appropriate in all cases and maybe even in the majority of cases. Um, so we need to think clearly about that. So what this policy direction is doing is it's opening up the door to be more restrictive, at least in the 20 meter setback area that exists um, and including policies that set the stage for how David would look at these minor variance applications in the 
future, and I do anticipate the number of minor variances to go up significantly if these changes are made. I know this is a big topic, um, and I'm thinking it's probably not something we can solve in the official plan, uh, but we can start the discussion in the, uh, through this process and set the stage for a bigger discussion through the zoning that we can come later. Okay. So I think we'll get some, some immediate feedback now, I'm sure, uh, but uh, it's, it's good at this point to see what the public has to say about this as well. Right, so um, Member Clark. Uh, I'm just gonna defer this one to David because um, David, can you tell me how many um, building permits have been issued uh, versus how many have gone to minor variants with the change that you made or they, that has been made in 2014-14 where anything within 50 feet could only be expanded by 20% and increase 20%. Do you know of anybody that's been able to design anything that actually works within that criteria? And I'm sure there's been a few people that have compromised, but how many uh, amendments and, and zoning bylaw uh, or, or, or bylaw changes have, have you seen or minor variances uh, as a result of that last change? Mr. Pink? Obviously, I don't have any uh, stats uh, directly at hand, but I would uh, I would note that um, probably outside of lot coverage, the most common minor variance we do receive is the redevelopment of structures within the front yard uh, in order to get relief uh, because they're located within the 20 meter 66 foot setback. Um, quite a common application. And on one hand, what is proposed would significantly simplify what is a complicated and confusing provision in a bylaw. On the other hand, as I said, it's currently uh, probably one of the top one or two most common minor variance applications already and there are permissions to build as close as 35 feet. What this would do is essentially require any new redevelopment or expansion at 66 feet um, and it is noted in the discussion column of the workbook. Um, I think the term is to retold you is drastically increase uh, the number of minor variance applications. That's probably an understatement if there's such a thing. So I think that's the only uh, sort of anecdotal stat I can give you. It will be a, a significant impact on the number of applications. Um, but again, not to imply that that's not necessarily the right avenue. I think what that does is allow each case by case basis to be uh, analyzed in accordance with the objectives of the official plan, uh, get community input from the neighbors uh, and have a committee of adjustment to opine on the appropriateness of each expansion. Um, so that's the proposed direction. Okay, thank you. And I want to remind you, we're not we're not debating this at this point. It's what's going out to the public so that we can get more information on it. Uh, it's and then we can come back, and the heavier debates are going to be our discussions are going to be afterwards. Uh, Member Arnie, thank you. Um, through you uh, to the developer or to the consultant, I guess I'm. I'm wondering, I'm looking forward to the public discussion and I'm looking forward to our discussions after we've been out to the public to determine what we're going to do. My, my personal feeling is that this policy should go out to the public in a more general form on the factor of grandfathering. Uh, grandfathering rights to undersized lots that are lots of record right now, grandfathering uh, redevelopment, and then leave the nitty gritty to the council and to the zoning bylaws as they come back. Because I can see us getting as hung up on this as we are on resorts. Just a comment. Okay. Okay, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. I um, through you, I guess I I agree with uh, Pat. It, um, I like some general conversation and some general feedback on grandfathering. Um, you know, for me, I think the variances come because of our zoning bylaw says the exact same footprint, and there's always little jogs and everything else. And somebody wants to redevelop and add a 200 square foot bedroom or whatever, or add a little two foot jog out. It has to go to a committee of adjustment. And uh, I think there might be a better way 
that we can do a um, grandfathering perspective. So I like the concept of grandfathering and discussing that with the public. I just want to be careful that we're not too prescriptive in this. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe that those are all the comments for this one, Mr. McDonald, if you want to move on. Okay, that's great. So I think we're getting pretty close to the end. Uh, item number 20, uh, regulating the expansion of existing marinas. Um, not really any significant changes, but there was discussion about including policies uh, and a number of design objectives uh, within the official plan to uh, deal with existing waterfront commercial and recreational uses. That was a specific ask last time. And I indicated that we would include uh, the items that would be dealt with by those policies. And, I, and, and we have, so it's parking and loading, boat slip density, location of storage areas, need for vegetative buffers and accessory uses. So, so these changes are quite minor. They just expand upon the policy direction that was originally um, suggested. So I'm hoping that will be fine. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, there was one other change. The original proposal included uh, waterfront commercial uses, uh, and that was removed on this draft. And the logic for removing it was that it would be discussed separately because of resorts were included in that, and they would become a separate uh, policy direction. So all I'm asking that if it, it does not become, end up being a separate policy direction discussion, that resort, that, that waterfront commercial uses be added back in so that all waterfront uh, uh, commercial operations, not just marinas, be part of the discussion. Thank you. Mr. McDonald, that sounds like a fair comment. So absolutely. So that seems reasonable to me um, because we're talking about design objectives and policies and not, not about density and all those other things. So, so that seems reasonable to me. Okay, great. Uh, Member Arnie. Thank you, just briefly. I know we uh, discussed when we discussed this policy earlier about the, um, the option of valet parking and, and both storage areas being kept further away. And I'm just wondering, I, I know I've tried to stay away from detail, but I'm wondering if that valet parking uh, would be a preferable redesign of a marina or expansion of a marina? That's a good point. I do recall that being discussed. I, I think it's in here um, in terms of location of storage areas, in terms of putting the boats further away. So you're that kind of thing. So I think it's in here right now and we'll certainly uh, spend some time on it when we write policy. Yeah, I, I just like the clarity of the term of valet parking. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. I believe that's it for this one. Yeah. So the only other item, well, there's quite a few items, but I wanted to touch upon the new policy direction that was added at the end on uh, dealing with uh, waterfront character areas. Um, and uh, this was uh, uh, discussed uh, last time. So we've just put some words around it. Um, basically saying it should include policies that recognize the character portions of the waterfront area that are decided significant rock outcrops and formations and visually significant trees and forests that make a positive contribution to the sense of place and history of the uh, township of Muskoka Lakes. Uh, there's quite a bit of discussion in the right hand column, um, but basically the idea is that uh, this would set up potentially processes in the future which identify character areas and put them on a map. Uh, alternatively, folks uh, through the official plan review process can make suggestions on where these character areas are and they could end up on a map or an appendix in an official plan and then be a consideration. Um, I also note that there are policies on character in the uh, existing FOP right now, but these would certainly go beyond them uh, and be more specific to waterfront areas. Okay, thank any you. Any, you have any comments on this? Well, it looks like that can go out as is. Great. 
So the next item on uh, my list was to circle back uh, to policy direction number 10, uh, dealing with uh, rural law creation. And uh, we did have, have a, a good discussion about this. There was a recognition that the current policies are very complicated. Uh, there are different sets of rules that apply uh, in various parts uh, of the township, uh, but we uh, got into a bigger discussion about rural development in general, about how much rural development is appropriate. Um, and in the end, uh, we were all left with not knowing exactly what direction uh, this group uh, wanted to go in. I can say uh, that there is a requirement in the district's official plan for the township's official plan to be clear on the amount of rural law creation. Uh, there is a need for some type of control over amount and location, and that's clearly a township decision, uh, but the rules need to be consistent across the board. And those were the comments uh, that we had uh, made last time around. Um, last comment is population expectations for the township for permanent residential use are quite low. And the current projections are 200 new people to the year 2036, which isn't a lot. Um, but at the same time, we have 900 uh, lots uh, that have uh, year-round road access in the township. Clearly not all for sale right now, um, but that potential exists. And those are some of the factors uh, that, uh, that we brought to the committee's attention last time. So essentially, we're looking for some direction on uh, how we should approach um, uh, this particular issue going forward. Um, and we uh, had some ideas in the second or third column uh, last time around um, to move away uh, from a permission for two new lots from every 40 hectare parcel to uh, rules that better deal with location and access uh, and proximity uh, to roads and services. And we also suggested that the policies be applied consistently um, and that um, uh, all environmental factors be considered. Um, and then lastly, we suggested uh, perhaps there should be a maximum number of lots that could be created on an annual basis as a form of control and law creation. So there's lots there and uh, we didn't get uh, a clear uh, direction from the group last time around. So, so now is the time to have that conversation again. Okay, anybody care to make any comments about where you would like to see the policy direction go on this? And um, actually, Councillor Hayes, you put your hand up. I was gonna ask you anyway, because I know you had some really good comments last time on this. Yeah, I, I don't know why you discourage rural development. Um, I think estate lots are what's going to happen in the future as we run out of lakefront lots. Our lakefront lots are considered rural. So we are talking about, I would say 95% of Muskoka Lakes is considered rural. We have two small towns, Port Carling and Bala. Um, and Personally, if I was moving up from the city, um, I probably would not be looking at moving to Bala or Park Carling. I would be looking for some area that I could have a large lot and raise my family. Um, and I think COVID has given us a little bit more edge to have that room. Um, I believe we're going to see an influx of growth because of COVID and as our broadband gets a little bit better. And a lot of our baby boomers uh, have winterized cottages and they're not cottages anymore, they're homes. And in the next year, and I think your 12 people per year population explosion is a little bit out of whack. I think you'll see that Muskoka Lakes will see a far larger growth rate than that. And so I wouldn't want to discourage rural lot creation. I think that it's something that is a characteristic of Muskoka Lakes. And um, I would 
like to not see any more red tape be put out for it. And my internet is unstable, so I apologize for that. That's uh... okay. I think you just muted yourself, Councillor Hayes. Do you want to unmute and finish what you were saying, or are you done? Um, the community center lawnmower is right behind me, so you may not be able to hear me very good. Um, yeah, I, I think that was pretty much all of the all of the issues that I had um, to go with. I think that it should not be more restrictive than the current policies. I would like to actually see encourage rural growth, but um, the district doesn't want to do that, so I would not uh, make anything more restrictive than it is right now. And got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Arnie. This is a, a difficult one. There's no doubt about it. Um, my, my sense, however, is it's not a lot different than um, the site plan requirements that we have for waterfront development. I think there are so many individual factors in every application for a severance to, to create a new lot that it, it's, it's hard to, um, to put a cap on it. I think though new development should include consideration of the natural heritage mapping, which we're planning on and, and consideration of the uh, natural capital of maintaining the, the full lot or the impact of the severance. I don't know if I'm making myself clear there, but in, in many cases, the intended use of the severed lot, the intended location of the severed lot, um, the, Im the importance of the maintaining of the maintenance of the whole lot are all factors that have to be considered as, to po as opposed to two lots per unit um, or number of lots per year. So I'm not being very helpful there because I'm only adding to the complexity of the issue. But I do tend to feel there should be, again, maybe that's my general direction that the official plan should give direction and then the specifics be worked out in zoning and um, bylaws. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa and then I'll go to Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Um, I, I, and I'm, I, while I'm listening to everyone, I'm realizing I had a conversation with a young fellow yesterday who I um, well, I was a soccer coach. I was all of those great things that you see a 25 year old living life in Muskoka. But in fact, we keep talking about lakefront and all of those great things where you need to have multiple millions of dollars, quite frankly, to live in Muskoka, Muskoka Lakes. Um, we aren't discussing where the next generation will live at all. Um, and in fact, I think we're closing a lot of doors with some of the policies that we're trying to put in place. Me in particular will mean, it will mean that my son will never be able to afford to live in Muskoka Lakes. Not likely to get a job that he's gonna get paid the amount of money to live on the waterfront. So where can he go? Well, his parents can't sever off his property because we're putting all these restrictions in uh, and nowhere else as well. So I'm really, I don't understand you know, why we use specific statistics, but we don't look at the real people or the real users. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that because again, we are talking about a whole generation that has nowhere to go. 
I'm going to make a can I make a suggestion here uh, to advance the discussion. I I I I, I can sense that this is a significant item, um, and I'm not sure we're going to get anywhere today either. So I'm going to suggest that the policy direction um, say something like this, and I'm just paraphrasing that the official plan, um, I guess, carry forward uh, the existing policies in such a way that they're consistently applied across the township and they're not more restrictive than they are today. And we work out the details later and come back to uh, this group and, and committee about, uh, about how we approach this going forward. Instead of providing specific uh, direction on how we're gonna do that, uh, it's a fairly complex issue, but I think the, the sentiment I'm getting is that we don't want to be more restrictive, but we don't know how permissive we want to be. And that's a big discussion, and I think it's bigger than, it's broader than what we can do today. And if there is agreement for that, then we can develop something along those lines and have that conversation at a future date. Um, okay, I'm going to put my two cents worth in here. I'm not sure I really understood what that meant, except that we're carrying forward what we have now. I may be wrong. Um, so I do have another comment, though, and, and would it be, I'm just trying to think if I was the public trying to chime in on this, would we want to know from our public if a state lot says, as uh, Councillor Hayes has said, is that something we want to look at? And as Councillor Nishikawa has said, can we develop small areas where it's not a fortune to live, but people can be here? Is that a question you can ask in this? Um, because I know that the direction from the district is, is not rural development. So I, I think that's where I get caught up in it. So my comment. Um, Member Clark? Just, uh, just before we go on, um, just uh, the Again. district's um, we have now huge demand, uh, more demand than I've ever seen uh, for people that are wanting to move from the city, cannot afford the lakes at all, uh, and even small lakes. Um, and really, I will tell you, Ballot, Port Carling are not even considerations at this point. Um, we basically look uh, around Bracebridge and Huntsville. Huntsville, um, you know, if you look at the Deerhurst area, the, the country club area, um, they are selling off, uh, uh, you know, new developed properties that are between one and three acres. Um, those, those lots they're building, um, in fact, we just sold one a million and a half dollars, right? So they're custom builders. And again, that's not addressing what uh, Councillor Nishikawa said, but I've been pretty consistent even when talking to Mr. Kelly, when you look at the cost of building because of bringing in hydro, doing uh, individual septics, um, having to punch a road into a, to a single lot, all, all of these things, uh, potentially blasting if you can't excavate. I mean, all of these things mean you're buying a lot at whatever that number is, and just to get yourself in the ground and start building, you know, on most of these lots, you're into a minimum of about a hundred grand. So I don't think this is necessarily going to be a solution for our children. Um, but the quite, I think the question, and it's more to the council, is you know, um, <laughs> and I don't want to go down this whole resort discussion, but you know, the majority of what was proposed at Manette isn't really waterfront property. I mean, there's you know, 50 homes probably at a maximum out of potentially a thousand that are on the waterfront. The rest of them are going to be off water residential at a reduced rate that have water access. And that's what legacy is after you get past the first five. And that's the resort side of it. And, you know, other than that, you may as well go to Bracebridge and move into a Mattamy home um, because they're a production builder that can do it at, at a reduced cost and put services, et cetera. And, so you have to decide, you know, if you're Port Carling or if you're Bella, I think based on everything we've seen now, um, you're going to be competing against Huntsville or Bracebridge for tax dollars, or unfortunately, likely Manette by the looks of it. So um, that's, that's the real deal, I think. 
Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, Mr. McDonald, I know you were going to uh, make a comment there. Yeah, I was just going to uh, simply say that the district's official plan uh, does allow for local municipalities like Muskoka Lakes to consider country residential, estate residential through official plan amendments. Um, there was, that was a discussion item when the district plan was prepared and, and actually in earlier drafts of the district plan, uh, there was no such policy, but it was added in at the request of area municipalities and others. Um, so one suggestion based on, on your comment is that we include a, a policy direction. It essentially says that the township's official plan include policies that encourage country residential development in appropriate locations uh, provided a whole host of issues are considered obviously including environmental and, and other. Um, and, and that's something we can go out to the public and get comments on with respect to law creation by severance. And, uh, sorry for being a little fuzzy when I explained this the first time, but I'm thinking that at the very least, we have to make sure that the rules that apply are consistently applied across the township. Currently, they're not. So I think that could easily be part of the policy direction as well. And if there is, there are any questions about the varying rules, Mr. Pink, I'm sure could fill you in, but perhaps those are the two elements of the policy direction that we go out with uh, to deal with this matter. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Edwards. Yes, thank you very much, uh, and that's Sir uh, Pitchman. Um, I would not put restrictions on. Uh, two severances per 100 acres is fine because if somebody wants to, to sever off with their children, it's there. Um, I wouldn't uh, say that you should uh, uh, limit the number of, of severances uh, per year. Let the market value come up with that. Yes, there's 892 lots and you say there may be only uh, two, two, two to 210 coming in, but you don't know that and that. We argue that at the district and that, um, and that trying to put limits and, and everything on growth. The province want it, but it doesn't mean it's gonna happen. It, it could spiral, it, it, it could be less. It's what the market will, will bear. So I would just leave it as it is. Um, if I wanted a lot off of my parents' place, that's fine. There's 892, but I, I wouldn't be forced to, to go and buy one somewhere else. And I, I think this is the, the whole thing. I think uh, knowing in uh, Calvin and everybody else said that, that was people's retirement as well. So I would just leave it alone and, and, uh, and, and not touch anything with it. Thank you. Okay, um, so I don't see any more comments. Do you feel you've got a policy direction you can work with now? Yeah, I, I do. And it's along the lines of what I just expressed. And mm -hmm. um, again, it's only going out for discussion and uh, there'll be time for additional discussion on this point. Okay. Um, so there were two requests to discuss uh, specific directions. Um, I think I'll start with number 22 because that was mentioned by a few and that deals with mineral aggregates. Um, and there was a concern expressed that uh, we have not um, incorporated uh, the sentiments of this group in the policy direction. And uh, we're certainly all ears and, and open to any uh, suggestions in that regard. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Roberts because I know he is the one who brought this up originally. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, for allowing this to, to be discussed again. Um, it, so I think it's the initial um, policy that is written there did miss um, addressing the huge concern expressions of concern from the residents and, and the um, official plan review committee. Um, this morning, I, I, I got up real early to reread the PPS and the MOP to see um, if it really ad did address the concerns of what I'm hearing from the constituents. And um, there's a, the MOP, in my opinion, um, does do a really good job in, in, in um, reinforcing, re uh, reiterating what the PPS says. And in there, um, there's two points that I just wanna highlight. 
Um, and what they are is under section H1, um, and it talks about um, access to the resources shall only be permitted if the following criteria are met. And an assessment addresses the matters included in section eight to satisfy uh, satisfaction of the approval authority. And the one that I wanna bring to the attention here, um, issues of public health, public safety, environmental in impact are addressed. And then the, the other point is also in section eight uh, down and it says, uh, it talks about um, issues pertaining to the environment. You have to minimize issues to the environment and minimize the issues to social, uh, social um, aspects. Um, when I read the initial review, our initial proposal of uh, the policy direction, it states that, in summary, it will address the requirements in order to implement the policies of PPS and, ML, and, and MOP, and I believe we're gonna do that. It includes compatibility with lake system health policies, economic objectives of the township. And um, I think we can do a little more rewording on that, and it would be a, a more suitable uh, policy. I think that we need to add um, in, in to that um, three or four things. One, at the very bottom, I'll just pops off my page, um, and economic objectives of the township, I think that should be revered to economic objectives and impacts to the township um, and the district, because the district uh, would share on any decision for, for a, uh, a um, aggregate operation. I think we need to add back into that as well, without going into all the details that I went in last time and all the suggestions, which are really, you know, we're getting down too too much in the weeds. But we must we must include the words from from the PPS and from the MOP that says minimize environment impacts and minimize social impacts. So that reflects what's in the PPS. It appears to me after reading the the, the, the MOP is that the district has come up with a grocery list or a list of things that, that should be done. The details are gonna be left to the township to come up with. What do these assessments look like, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we, we, um, we in the district, must, our township must go deeper specifically um, because of the perceived or real um, stress that this is gonna put on our, 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 our uh, township. So basically, if you would consider adding those, uh, and I know that uh, I'll speak to the public that are listening here, because it is that this will cover all the points we need to go forward, get public input, and then we'll get down to the details later when we write the official plan. Okay, thank you. So in, in response to that, um, and I probably could have spent a bit more time on this policy direction, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so we can certainly add in that language uh, that is also in the, uh, the district's plan as well, which as, as you know, I wrote. Um, so I'm very familiar with that language and I'm, I'm certainly pleased and happy to do that here. Okay, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, uh, I echo um, and that Councillor Roberts uh, comments on that. We have to do something and that we just can't let things go because it is the environment and that is our uh, our uh, biggest asset. So uh, I, I would get that as tight as possible. And that, thank you. Okay, so the rewording, I think we'll, we'll cover that as you said. So, okay, I think we're on to the next item. I think so. The other one that I had written down was item number nine, dealing with uh, development and cleaning the areas. I don't recall who raised it. I didn't write that down. Uh, but that was one that was specifically identified. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz, I believe that was you. That's correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very brief because I know we're running out of time. At the last meeting, it was discussed that possibly Walker's Point should be added to community centers, or at least a discussion of that. I also added that possibly Minette should be. And the, the, the revised document says we're not going to discuss them because the MOP 
doesn't uh, uh, allow for. And I think uh, this exercise of the official plan is to uh, uh, for us to develop some of our own ideas. And I think that they should be included and go out to the public. That doesn't mean we're going to do it, but at least we'll see what kind of support there is for it. And if you'll notice on other areas, there are other areas where we're going out for public input. And I think that should be included. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes? <laughs> Yes, I would agree with Councillor Jagowitz. I think it's a chicken and an egg uh, situation. What, does it go on to our OP first or does it go on to the district OP? And I, I think that it should go out for consultation. Um, I, th I think that that way at least we'll know which way to go when the next time the uh, OP opens up. So just a quick response on my end. Um, I uh, I did include a comment about the MOP having to be changed first, but there's no harm in going out and asking the public about Walker's Point. Um, so certainly that could be added in. Uh, with respect to Manette, um, that's a separate item uh, that's on its own track. Um, so I wouldn't recommend including Manette in this discussion at this time, but I'm open to including Walker's Point. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz? Yes, then just to follow up. So in the event that uh, that doesn't get its separate discussion, uh, then I then I would, uh, would you agree that then it then should be included if in fact resorts are not discussed uh, as a separate item? Well, Manette is not, Manette's its own entity. I think that's what Mr. McDonald was trying to, to say. It is covered um, separately. So, so therefore Manette will be discussed as a, it will then? No, Manette is part of a separate OPA. Uh, Mr. McDonald, would you like to do the technical answer to that? Yes. Um, so uh, at, at this point in time, Manette is, when I say separate track, uh, it's going through a separate official plan amendment process at both uh, the local level and the district level. And there will be a draft of that amendment available shortly uh, that will be taken through that process. And all uh, decisions, discussions about what Minette is called, how it's characterized, and its density of development, and so on, is, in my view, to be dealt with through that process only. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Arnie? Thank you, Chair Birchman. This, this may be a sidebar, but it does relate to community uh, development. I noted in the attainable housing it was specifically directed only to the urban areas. And to speak to uh, Councillor Nishikawa's point and, and to uh, Councillor Hayes, I think there's an opportunity for uh, development of that nature in our communities. And I hate to see them specifically eliminated um, in our OP from that option. I realize the servicing is probably the, the background issue, but as I said, I, I have some concern about them being specifically eliminated uh, for that option in our, in our OP. Okay, any more comments? So I think we're done with our comments on that one, Mr. Mc. Oh no, I see Councillor Edwards. Uh, yeah, I, I've hit uh, quite a few of the uh, public. They're very, very concerned about the uh, resort developments and everything else like that. Um, our uh, policies weren't uh, tight enough. And I, I, I have heard that they should wait for the district and that a lot of the councillors were elected to, to get the resort uh, problem solved. And I would like to see something on that because as the mayor had, had said before maybe some of these small ones should maybe just be downsized to residential and would save the the actual uh, and that development but i would like to see public input on this at least thank you um well councillor edwards i believe we're discussing that at council next week um it's not on the table uh for today but i'm i'm sure there'll be lots of discussion and things will go out to the public on that topic whenever that may happen. It's just not on today's agenda. So, um, Mr. McDonald? 
Um, so that deals with the two that I had written down. There were a couple of other comments uh, about um, increasing lot sizing uh, across the board uh, on all of the lakes by 150 feet. Um, and there was, uh, I believe the mayor uh, raised an issue uh, about uh, maybe changing the rules with respect to how much development you can have on a property provided it's more limited. And uh, I think he was looking for some more flexibility, um, but perhaps he can, he can speak to that further. But those were the only two items I have in my list uh, from the early discussion we had before we started today. Um, uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. If I can just to uh, speak to that, you know, it, it's interesting as we talk about increased lot sizes, uh, go back to policy direction one that we're talking about environment protection. Um, sorry, just what lake health system and how do we increase that increased lot sizes is going to do that. I, I think maybe that the idea, you know, potentially increased setbacks, potentially increased lot sizes. Those are kind of contemplations, potentially reduced development. These are all things that can help our lake health system that should be contemplated. And again, I, I, the one specific that I want to look at it potentially down zoning properties, because that's certainly going the ability to down zone properties, because that is against policy right now, but that would certainly help um, our overall environment. But what I, I do argue, and I just want to make sure that I'm very clear about this. When we regulate people, to build one cottage and one bunky cabin, and we allow a lot coverage of 10, or 10%, or we go to 11 in the official plan, and they start building 7,500 square foot cottages. What if we thought creatively and we said, okay, let's put two 3,000 square foot cottages on the property, gets me 6,000 square feet, and then maybe a bunky, and limit lot coverage to 8%. If you want a second cottage, you only get 8% and you only get a 6,000 square feet of cottage to be able to build between one, two, three, or whatever it is. Or if we do the math on it, we get 7,500 maximum now and another 650. So we're getting 8,000 square feet of cottage. Let's divide that into three and lower the lot coverage. I think ultimately would be better for the environment and may also address some of our uh, long-term planning and multi-generations living on one property issues. So. Um, it's a different way to think about it, but we force a lot of tree removal and monster cottages because of ROP. I'll, I'm open to comments from this committee. Um, so, yeah, and my 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 suggestion of the increased um, uh, um, frontage was the same same theory as as Mayor Harding. It's a tool to work with lower density. Uh, so now I'm not sure what you were looking for, Mr. McDonald. I, were you going to break open a discussion with this, or it was just a request to have, for me, it was a request to have the public input on it, not a discussion today, because that could take us probably till dinner time if we really wanted. So, but you're. Well, I, I think I have a I have a bit of an answer. So, in 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 our policy direction number one. Uh, we start off with the whole idea of, of incorporating enhanced uh, protection policies in the official plan. Uh, we could include a bullet item in there that basically says that consideration be given to increasing the lot frontage requirements uh, along the lakes. Uh, we wouldn't specify what the number is because I'd like to really think about that some more. But what we could do is indicate what they are today uh, and get public input uh, on that. The other ad I was going to make in there was that in addition to looking only uh, at setbacks from the water's edge or high water mark and what you can do in that setback area if you have an existing building, I believe I mentioned that, that a review of all other standards that affect uh, development on lots be reviewed, including lot coverage, uh, including uh, number of bunkies, including maximum floor area, and so on, just so that that gets out there, um, because I think it's an important point. Uh, setting back from the water is only one element. There are lots of other things the township could do. So I'm going to suggest that that I include those two ideas in policy direction number one, um, and that we get feedback on those uh, from the public. Uh, Mr. Pink would like to jump in here. 
you, Chair Bergen. Just uh, one very uh, quick point. I would uh, agree that's one option to add number uh, two policy direction number one and increased uh, frontage. Uh, but just with respect to the uh, increasing the number of cottages per waterfront residential property, just point out that the district of Muskoka official plan is very clear that it only allows singular unit residential development on the waterfront. So, uh, Your Worship, I think we could look at policies with respect to number of bunkies or sleeping cabins, lot coverage and those sort of aspects, but we wouldn't allow um, more than a singular cottage per lot. That would have to change at the district level first. Thanks for that, David. I, I did mean bunkies, not, not cottages, but thanks for that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nishikawa? Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to comment on the mayor's uh, request to downzone uh, resort properties. I would be against that, whatever that looks like. I uh, was involved with that in the early 2000s. I don't think that it benefited uh, Muskoka Lakes. Again, we are talking about removing the ability for people to visit Muskoka Lakes. And I'm not talking about the next five or 10 years. I'm talking about the next 50 years. Properties have to be designated for, um, if, if, if in fact we are a community that is involved in tourism, which I think we are, um, and, and that is our future look, we need to have those properties available. Um, and there will be a need and there, are, there will be someone that is looking for those and develop those for future years. So I don't agree that we should be looking at downzoning those properties. I also um, have been a little bit con concerned or confused about um, the comment that district says you can only have one, one residence on the property. Um, I would like to look at a different model that, for instance, we talk about potting. We, we haven't talked about potting, but we certainly talked about that over the years. And the ability to take that square footage allowed on that property and um, not to create a little mini resort, but, but certainly to, to make it a family compound, I believe we should find room and, and even advise district and find room for that type of, of use on the property. Certainly it was a use historically. Um, and I, I do think we should open doors up to have that discussion. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. I think we're getting into the discussion part of this right now. And I think we're just looking for public input. So uh, Member Lundell and Councillor Jaglowitz, if, if it's something to do with public input and, and not whether you're for or against what we're talking about here, please carry on. I'm just, I'm really conscious we're, we're, we're almost out of time now. So uh, Member Lundell. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bridgman. I, I'm very appreciative of uh, Councillor Nishikawa raising tourism. Um, and we were asked at the beginning of this exercise if there were any additional policy directions that we would like to see put out to the public for input. And one that I would like to suggest is um, getting some input on cultural planning, municipal cultural planning. Um, we have a lot of very unique, interesting, character-driven communities, um, locations of banks of historical cottages, a gorgeous uh, natural landscape. And I think it would be a very interesting exercise to look at how we could leverage these assets together to attract a new kind of uh, tourism opportunity that would be focused on our historical resources, our heritage um, centers, our communities, uh, natural activities, active transportation, and try to build a, a new focus for tourism. I see this contributing to economic growth, and I see it as a positive um, forward-looking policy that could really benefit the township. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Councillor Jaglowitz, un unmute yourself, please. Thank you, I thought I had, thank you for correcting me. I'm responding to the mayor's suggestion that we include a discussion on downzoning resort properties. I have no problem with that, 
but I believe in fairness, then all of the resort issues should come forward. I don't think we should be able to pick and choose one, uh, but I, I totally support that subject going out along with all the other resort issues because we, we have to look at it in the broader context of, of resorts and not, uh, not just in that vein. So thank you. Okay, Mr. McDonald, I don't see any more comments. I don't know whether or what you want to go forward with now. It is noon. Well, I, I think um, I can certainly, I do, I do uh, have that email regarding the cultural heritage and uh, leveraging assets. I think uh, that could certainly be included as a policy direction. I'm, I'm fairly certain most would agree with that uh, when presented with that as an idea. So that's something we can include. I, I had two very small items, uh, short items on, left on my agenda. And one was dealing with the form of the document itself, just so you understood where, what my thinking is in terms of this going out. And, and, and very simply, I wanted to indicate that the policy direction, when they go out, we wouldn't include the initial one and, and the discussion on how it changed to the one we're, we're now agreeing on to go out, just for simplicity purposes. That's all I wanted to really indicate uh, to the group. So we're just saying, here's the policy direction and here's some context. And much of that context is already written out in the discussion column. And we would be adding some additional context based on this discussion today. So that was one item. And the, the second item is consultation. Uh, when we submitted the proposal to do this work, it was obviously pre-COVID. Uh, and we had all kinds of ideas about going out to the public and having in-person meetings with people. Uh, we reached out to the firm on our team uh, regarding that, and they've come back and suggested uh, that they could, uh, in exchange for having in-person meetings, run a virtual public meeting, uh, which is very common now and happening all over the place, and, uh, and develop a survey the last time they did that, we had over 800 responses. So we feel that that would work out quite well. And we just wanted to advise the committee uh, and, and, uh, and the working group uh, that that was how we would be going out uh, to the public. Uh, there would obviously be some enhanced wording on the website and direct emails going out to those on mailing lists and so on. Uh, but we are proposing something of a, in a virtual world uh, to get the kind of input we're looking at looking for on these directions. Uh, so those were the only two other items on, on the agenda. Um, today, I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that uh, there's agreement, uh, generally speaking, that we can now finalize this document and, 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 and get it sent out. Um, but we're certainly in your hands, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, in, in terms of how, that's, uh, how that is going to happen. I also recognize we're at 12 noon. I'm sorry, you all will also recognize which? Well, I also recognize the time as well, too, in terms of how much time uh, there is left to have a conversation. I, I was certainly hopeful at the outset that we wouldn't need another meeting before finalizing this, um, because we do think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, beneficial for us to go out as soon as possible in the summer months. Even though we aren't having virtual meetings, we still think it's important because people are up here, they're thinking about uh, their environment, and we think it's important to get the word out. So thank you. I think you've got your directions from, from today, your policy directions. I think that's fine. Um, I just have one question. Is it going to be one big virtual meeting? I'm just thinking of people working during the day or at night. What is the plan in terms of how much public input, if you could help me out with that? Yeah, based on the feedback I've got from the other consultant, it would be one virtual meeting. Um, I'm assuming it's probably going to be on a weekend as opposed to a weekday. Um, and the survey obviously is 24 hours. It happens, uh, you know, with, a, with obviously a drop dead date. Uh, but I'm thinking that the virtual meeting is definitely a weekend event. Okay, thank you. So if you have time, we've got a couple of people who would like to make some comments. Um, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it sounds like uh, you, you believe that uh, we've wrapped up our job, but in my understanding that the resort issue is coming to Council. What is your plan in the event that Council authorizes uh, for the resort piece to be included? 
uh, Mr. Pink would like to answer that. I see you rising, uh, Nick, if you did want to say anything further. Um, but uh, there is a resolution to be considered shortly at this meeting, uh, endorsing the final policy directions to go to the public. Uh, that would be considered for ratification at the council meeting next Wednesday, uh, together with a report uh, on a council agenda next Wednesday on the uh, tourist resort issue. Oh, sorry. Minutes will be on. Okay, we're, we're talking technical stuff here for, for a second. Um, can we just, maybe we go on mute for just, okay, if you just want to turn you, your yours off then. Sorry. Sorry, so um, just David and, and, and the clerk are going to have a look at some technical issues here. And I, we still have a couple of people who want to speak. So we'll move on with that as they discuss it. Um, Member Arnie. Thank you. Just very briefly, I, uh, uh, it, it will be interesting to see how they format the survey, but I believe that is uh, the most practical way at this time, and probably people have time to look at a survey at this time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, I may be waiting for the outcome of the discussion between uh, Mr. Pink and I think the clerk are having a discussion. If I understood Mr. Pink correctly, when we pass a resolution in a few minutes, we're going to close off the opportunity to bring the resort discussion uh, to this group. That's what I thought I heard anyhow. I have a lot to say on that if that's true. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that I heard the same thing. So now I am confused. So, um, Mr. Pink, are you? It's just to clarify, no, uh, uh, Councillor Kelly, that was not uh, what I was implying. What I had intended uh, was a resolution on the current agenda, uh, endorsing the current policy directions, which then prior to ratification at Council, uh, could be amended if the direction is to include further policy direction on tourist resorts. Unfortunately, what I may have alluded that the clerk just advised me is the procedural bylaw requires the seven days prior to have those minutes approved. And I think we're six days prior uh, as the next uh, week's meeting is on a Wednesday. Um, that I'm just uh, trying to think through what's the, the preferred route here. Uh, it may mean ratifying the resolution um, at a later date and unfortunately delaying some of the public consultation, uh, which is not ideal, uh, but I'll continue to discuss with the clerk to see how we can uh, accommodate any changes that come out of next Wednesday's meeting if, if a change does occur. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm concerned that we mix resorts with the policy directions. Uh, decision. I think that prior to the policy direction decisions, council needs to discuss whether resorts are in or out. And then based on that, we go to the policy directions. But I think there's enough thoughts around the table. It should be separate. I could tell reconvene. Uh, we we will do so. Yeah, how they're going to do that? So I will I will log off and we'll see if that closes it out. 